And we are live here on Plus One EXP's Roll for Content channel. My name is Tony Vicenda. I am Chief Alchemist here at Plus One EXP, which is a weird little brand that multiclasses in tabletop game design, beard and skin care alchemy, and the Bardic College of Content Creation. Our hope and desire here at Plus One is to help amazing designers find great players who love their games, and amazing players find great designers whose games they can love. We do that in a lot of different ways, but the most fun way is just to sit down with those designers and play those games, and that is exactly uh, what we are doing today with the Star started to line up some folks that I, I absolutely love and I'm thrilled to have uh, on. Let's start with the creator of the game that we are about to play. Uh, Chris, why don't you tell people who you are, what you do, and tell us a little bit about the game we're about to launch into. Okay, so uh, my name's Chris McDowell. Um, I make games at bastionland.com. Um, so you might know Into the Yard or Electric Bastionland. Uh, and we're playing the upcoming game Mythic Bastionland, which is kind of the third game in that series and it's kind of a game of it's about knights going out seeking glory and uh, exploring a kind of strange realm and um and seeing what kind of trouble they can get into really while while still fulfilling their oath and uh, maintaining knightly conduct awesome uh, very excited to have you on. Very excited to be playing. Uh, you and I got to play um, when you were doing the End of the Odd Remastered over on a different channel. It's our first time having you on. Very glad to have you here. Excited to have you run for us also, too. Um, but let's meet our other players. Let's start. Uh, first time in a long time. So glad to, to see uh, his face again. Uh, Sean, why don't you tell people a little bit about yourself? Hello, world. Uh, yes, I'm Sean F. Smith, uh, it's he and him, and uh, I. you may know me from, from a number of different things, such as if you, you have Moonlight on Roseville Beach, uh, I wrote one of the uh, the things in that, I edited Orkborg, um, I uh, I own the Friendship Edition of, uh, of Into the Art, wow. which uh, which is the good old rare one, the very first time Lost Pages put it out, and there was the, the bonus one you could give to a friend, uh, which, was, which was the best. So, uh, yeah, my... My credentials here. Um, I am I am a medievalist by trade, so uh, well not by trade any longer. But uh, so I'm very excited to uh, to lean hard into some like wonderful Middle English nonsense. Love it. Excited to have you here. And also, um, people may not know this if. Moonlight on Roseville Beach, which is funding right now, gets to $12,000. We're going to produce um, an actual play. And part of that agreement, though I, I readily said yes when Richard asked me, uh, was to work with Sean on it. So um, I don't know if Richard told you that or not, Sean, but uh, I am very This is, this is news to me now, and it is good <laughs> news indeed. <laughs> but yeah, maybe we could include Sean since he worked on it. I was like, that'd be great. I love playing with Sean. So. <laughs> Um, but it's got to get there first. So head over to that that Kickstarter. Uh, give it a look. Give it a back. It's a really great game. Uh, we played here on stream in one of the most unhinged streams of that game ever. Uh, maybe we'll get, do it better justice next time. Uh, speaking of that unhinged stream, uh, Keegan, why don't you tell people who you are, what you do, where they can find you online? Hi, yeah, I'm Keegan. Uh, you can find me online at keeganexe.com or on, I don't know, whatever the social media of the moment is at keeganexe. Um and yeah, I design games and stream games here on Plus One. Awesome. Sweet. And last but not least, we've got Colin. Colin, give people the things. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm Colin Leswear. I um, design games as Biodens Beard RPG. You can find me biodensbeardrpg.com and at biodensbeardrpg. I make games that were um, heavily inspired by Into the Odd um so thanks chris for the inspiration and me wholesale ripping off uh, all of your rules and systems um it's games like uh rune cairn and we deal in lead awesome uh super excited to have you here uh, as always love getting a chance to play your games but also just love having you on as a player as well um well we've got a lot of different things going on here at plus one over the next couple of weeks before we talk about safety and dive into play love to tell you about a couple of them uh, we don't have a lot of streams coming up next week but we do have take flight uh which is going to be happening on thursday with cat um we were, she sits down with an emerging designer and an experienced designer and help them chart a destination to great game design for that inexperienced designer's uh, new game, just kind of talking through some of what they're looking about. I know they're going to be looking at promotion this week, I believe is the plan, and how you promote your game once you have it designed. So come back for that. Um, also, um, we have a Kickstarter for the Wassailing of Claws Manor um, launching on Tuesday as well. So if you're looking for two great Kickstarters to back, uh, check out the Wassailing. You can go to ttrpg.link slash 
Ho No, uh, that's H O N O, <laughs> to check that game out because it is a uh, Bedlam Hall inspired uh, Christmas is about to go off the rails because of dark, arcane uh, holiday spirit influencing the Claus family, and only their serving staff uh, can protect them. But it is a trophy dark game. So if you like that system, uh, check it out. And then last but not least, if you want to support what we do here, uh, if you want to help make things more sustainable and humane in the RPG space, I'd love to have you check out RPG Zine Club. You can go to RPG zine.club to do that um basically it's the ability to join the club uh, and get one or two new zines that are launching in physical form for the first time ever every single month uh, by new and emerging designers a lot of them who can't access crowdfunding for one reason or another or who just don't want to because man kickstarter is a lot of work i bet chris is kickstarter a lot of work or is it just easy for you <laughs> um i'll let you know after this one <laughs> it feels like a lot of work right now uh so um we love helping them get their games into print it helps create a more sustainable uh invested community that's in that's putting energy and financials into a group without them having to go through the crowdsourcing model. Uh, we help them edit and prepare their games for release um, and then help them get them into print and into wider distribution. So if you want to help that, uh, be part of changing the way that we help games get made here at Plus One EXP, uh, go over to RPGZine.club and check it all out. But you didn't hear us come here to hear us, Shill. You came here to watch us play an amazing game. Um, as we enter into that space, there's a couple tools we use here on the channel to help make sure everybody stays comfortable and stays on the same page. Those are the lines, veils, the X card, and an open door policy. Lines are things that may happen in the world of a game, but don't happen while we play it. Uh, they're off limits. So we have a strong line against sexual violence and sexual coercion here on the stream. Uh, veils are things that may come up during play, but we handle them in a specific way. Uh, when they do, that may only be within a certain context or just mentioning them and moving forward, not dwelling on them. Uh, there's a lot of different ways it can be handled, but we kind of just put a loose veil over the top of them. Uh, and then the X card is the ability for anybody to say or type X to pause the game, identify something that's causing an issue. We'll pull that out, put something else in, in its place and move forward from there. We might update our lines and veils. When we do, does anybody have any additional lines or veils they want to name? All good. Cool. Uh, just remember the X card is in play also too. So if you need to use that, feel free to. Um, we also have an open door policy, which just means we all have real lives outside of this small little box that you see us in. Um, we are going to take care of ourselves. So if we need to hop up, have a conversation with somebody, step off for a second, eat, drink, do all the normal things that normalish people do, um, we will do that. Is that a purple liquid? I'm not. I'm not judging you. I just. I'm very excited, and so it's it's a purple cup. You can probably oh, see okay. there. It looks like a purple liquid within. right at that level of the purple, and I was like, "That's that's <laughs> enjoyable." That's um, later. <laughs> that's later. Uh, with that said, uh, we hope you take care of yourselves just like we will also too. So, um, with all that out of the way, Chris, I'm going to hand things over to you to take us into Mythic Bastion Land. Okay, so. Um... So Mythic Bastion Land, we're going to kind of discover the setting as we go, but I think it would be a good place to start with the characters that we've got in the game so far. So we randomly determined that there's like 72 different knights in the book, and I picked a few out and we sort of randomly shared them out between people here, and then you rolled your virtue to kind of like your ability scores uh, in this game. Um, so with that little bit of information that we've got, it might be good, I think, to go around and just get an idea of uh, who your character is, uh, or at least what type of knight you are, at the very least. Um, and anything you kind of started to glean about your character um, so far, if that sounds good. Um, so if we go in the order that's on my screen, uh, Tony, are you happy to go first? Sure. Uh, God damn it, past Tony. Uh, <laughs> my character, I am playing... Um, <laughs> I am playing a character named, uh, uh, Sir Kittimerink. Um, Sir Kittimerink is a dinky dude. Um, he is, uh, he is pretty small. Um, and, uh, but as, as pretty great clarity, um, I ride an Arctic steed, uh, that turns white in winter. And I, um, I, I, I strike you as the kind of person who could kill or be killed at a moment's notice because I am playing, uh, the coin knight, which means that I have the option to either just kill something, uh, but I flip a coin when I do that, and I can also be killed depending on the way that it hand that it lands down, which is uh, super swingy and amazing. Uh, I'm passionate about generosity. I just want to want to take care of people and give to those in need. Uh, so, um, 
I think that's I think that's everything. Is that are, are those good things to say? Yeah, that sounds good. And the thing you can probably see on the bottom of each of your character sheet is you've got the oath that as knights you have all taken this oath, and that is to seek the myths, honor the seers, and protect the realm. And we'll discover what that means as we go through. Uh, so we've got Tony as the uh, the coin knight. Um, Colin, who is your knight? So I am Sir Horst, uh, the bloody knight. Um, so my virtue, or sorry, yeah, my virtue is my vigor is fairly high. So um, I'm a robust, strong figure with lots of blood, hence the name. But my clarity and spirit are fairly low. So um, uh, I guess I'm not one, not much one for thinking. Um, I'm a young knight, and my justice, or sorry, my passion is justice, to restore the balance of justice. And I ride a bullish war horse named Claymore. Awesome. Fantastic. Um, brilliant. So uh, so next we have Keegan. Uh, who's your knight? Yeah, I am Sir Adair. I am the fox knight. I'm a young knight errant. Um, yeah, I think that's all the things. Yeah. So again, we, we've, the, the pattern in this group seems to be... Um, the, so the, the three virtues you have, you have vigor, clarity, and spirit. Vigor seems to be very high throughout the group. So a group of vigorous young knights, perhaps slightly lacking in clarity and spirit. So we'll see whether that does cause a problem uh, as we go through. Uh, and the final knight, uh, Sean. Uh, today I will be playing Sir Knifed, um, who is the saddle knight. So his, uh, his shield is a... Um, I was going to say a horseshoe rampant, but it's, uh, it's the wrong way out, so it's spilling all the luck uh, on, a, on a field of gold. Um, he is uh, he's quite baby-faced. I mean, he is young, but he like, looks particularly baby-faced. Rides uh, a very well-looked-after horse called Concord, and uh, despite being baby-faced, also pretty much has like the cheekbones of Benedict Cumberbatch, which you'll notice has absolutely no cuts anywhere near his face because he is, uh, he is of great clarity, and he, uh, he has managed to avoid... Even the even the basics of harm from a young man's shaving, and um, and as the saddle knight, obviously you can speak in um, the song of the steed. So you can speak in a voice comprehensible to horses, um, but you can't necessarily command them. You still have to reason with the horse. Um, so yeah, that's our group of four knights. And the way that it works in this world is uh, one part of your oath is to honor the seers. And the seers are these people who, well, I use the term people quite broadly because we're touching onto the edge of humanity, perhaps, with seers, because they kind of live in the past and the future and the present all at once. And this means they have great knowledge and they can often kind of tell you all the information you would need to um, achieve anything you would want to achieve as a knight. However, having all this information can lead to them being quite strange beings and they can sometimes give information and give instructions that are perhaps not always particularly helpful. Um, but one part of your oath was to honor the seers. And as part of that, um, the four of you have been kind of deemed to travel as a company. Um, so you will be the company of knights that are traveling together. Um, and you, in particular, you have been sent into a, um, a neighboring realm, perhaps to where you are familiar. So an unknown, region to the four of you you've been sent to seek out the ghoul knight um and that's all that you know you know that the ghoul knight is somewhere within this realm and the seers have said that it is of vital importance that you four particularly find the ghoul knight um and you didn't get much more instruction than that um you were given a um a passage on a a rowboat um, and you have, for the last few days, um, you and the sort of barely skeleton crew of this kind of longship style boat have been uh, pushing through this thick fog that is just sort of blanketed over the sea, this pearlescent fog, um, and just this harsh stinging drizzle in the air. It's been miserable weather. It's supposedly spring, but it doesn't really feel like it in the air today. Um, and it's been a few days, but you are sort of now approaching where you can see land on the horizon. Um, it would say that it's morning um, and the boat that you're on is sort of uh, pushing up towards, like I say, a point where you can see 
to both your kind of left and right, you can make out that there are significant bodies of land there. Um, so you have a bit of a choice here. Um, to your left, so what you know as to be the south, um, you can see what looks to be sort of the main continent of this realm. But further in the distance to the right, um, you can just about make out a smaller island off just barely visible through the mist, um, sort of through the parting mist. Um, and yeah, that, that, that's what you can see. Um, you haven't been told where to find the ghoul knight, but where would you like to start? Did they did they imply once we found the ghoul knight what we were supposed to do with them? Are we supposed to return with them? Or was it just once you find him, all things will be made clear? The seers were very cryptic about this. And yeah, they, the, the implication is that if you find the ghoul knight, um, if, if in doubt as a knight, uh, there are seers all over the world. So you can always find a seer in this realm and perhaps ask them for more guidance. Um, in general, knights are found in holdings, which are kind of the the small fortresses and castles that exist in this kind of world that's mainly a world, world without roads and trails. So these kind of very isolated settlements are usually owned by a knight. Um, so that would be a good kind of way to start looking for him. Have we heard anything about the ghoul knight? Anything like any rumors or... The years didn't give you anything, but um, but as with these things, you would sort of expect that um, locals who live in this realm uh, would probably have more information about the Ghoul Knight. Some of them might know who they are. All you have is the name, and I would say it's not a, it's not a great start with a name, is it, the Ghoul Knight? Mm -hmm. <laughs> For at least much of the journey, uh, Sir Knife has been under the impression that it is the Gaul Knight, so G-A-L-L, um, and that we are looking for a, a budding man off of a uh, off of an oak. But, uh, but I've, I've come to terms with, with what it was that we have learned. Um, so yeah, so like I say, you've got the main body of land, which is kind of like sharp, craggy, rocky um, sort of landscape. Um, but the, the island that's off to the right, you can't make out the sort of the landscape of the island because it's a little bit further away in the mist. Okay. So does the would the the name Ghoul Knight would that conjure up similar kind of connotations, um, like to to kind of standard fantasy tropes, so like undead or something that feeds on flesh, that sort of thing. So in this world, um, there are lots of stories everywhere of things like like you say of like the undead and monsters. Um, but they tend to be, in this world, the line between stories and reality is kind of blurred, like myths become reality. So it's not like it's not like there's sort of known ghouls wandering around, um, but most kind of people would have some kind of story that they might think is just a story about undead or something like that. So yeah, it would suggest some kind of um, deathly connotations, perhaps, yeah. Cool. But they're still a knight, supposedly, so... I mean... You know, there's this sharp craggy land. That island seems really interesting to me. So I'll, mm -hmm. I'll as Snowblind and I disembark the ship, we'll uh, we'll start trotting towards the island. And I guess I'll just hope that everybody else follows, because I didn't say anything <laughs> whatsoever. So, um, so you're steering the ship towards the island, let's say. Oh, is, we're still on the ship. Yeah, great. I love that. That's even easier because I figured I was like, I don't know how we're gonna get to this island. We'll just figure it out later. That's even better. Yeah, let's take, <laughs> take the ship towards the island. So, so um, you probably don't want to put your horse into the water to uh, for it to to swim yet. I I know it can, but now now is not the time. It, we have a boat. It's almost like it floats like an ice flow. I just I, I just thought I would show it off, but that's fine. We can use the boat. <laughs> okay, so bear with me. Um, as you approach the island to the north, um. It's it, it takes a little while to get there because, like I say, it was just in the horizon. So we'll be it'll, it'll, we'll say that we're sort of getting into afternoon now. Um, and there's generally there's three phases of the day. So there's morning, afternoon, and night. And as a general rule, it's not good to be traveling at night. Um, it's good to sort of get it ideally get somewhere safe, but at the very least, sort of um, stop traveling and set up a camp for the night. Um, so as you approach this island. Um, sort of isolated island uh, out out in the in the in the sort of pearlescent mist as you approach the mist the, the, the island almost vanishes as you get closer towards it because the mist is really sort of closing over around it 
you can see what looks like the black uh, sort of twisted branches of dead trees um, sticking out almost through the fog um, and a sort of a, a white gray kind of beach as you get closer with the boat and kind of moor the boat up onto the beach. Um, and yeah, it's like that, like, like I said, the beach kind of leads up into this kind of wood of um, black dead trees and the fog is really thick around here. Um, in, in, when you were on the, on the water, it was kind of just like impeding your vision a bit. But here it's now almost like you can, you can almost taste the fog and like it's, you can almost feel it on you like cloth and it's sort of almost constricting um, around you. Um, so yeah, what do you do? Um, there's just real fast a question in the chat. What are the dangers of night travel? So if you travel at night, um, the main problem is um, you are going to, for one thing, you're going to be traveling blind, which means there's a chance that you will not go the direction you want to go. Um, and the second thing is traveling through night will gradually sort of sap away your clarity because your senses, your clarity is kind of your grip on reality and your uh, the quickness of your senses in your mind. And it kind of exhausts your mind to travel at night because you can't trust your senses in the dark. Um, and if your clarity is ever reduced to zero, um, you are kind of exposed because without any clarity, you're not really able to defend yourself very well. So you'll basically be treated as having zero guard um, if your clarity ever gets reduced to zero. Okay, so that's bad. Got you. Yeah, so don't do it. Is... <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad we landed on this great, uh, friendly island, it seems. Where like. nothing goes exactly wrong the ever. Kind of place we want to be. Um, yeah. Um, are we are we able to kind of moor up to shore, or do we have to go through some of this leech infested water? Uh, no, I, I think it, I think it, the beach is relatively gentle, so it's easy enough to sort of get your boat up onto the sand and disembark. And you know, your horses are in the little I don't know the name of parts of a boat. They're in the horse box of the boat. Yeah. Um, and yeah, they're they're safe. Um, and yeah, you can kind of disembark onto the sand. The horse um, part of a boat is one of the most commonly known names on yeah, the it's, boat. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, um, Listen, you, know, you don't know how this setting works. It could be called the horse box. <laughs> I believe it. I was, I was, we, I was woven. I'm in. writing it in right now. Um, the uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, this looks like a great place to stop for the night. Um, so yeah, because it, so it's at, it's the start of the afternoon. So you've got sort of one more phase of travel. So to get a little bit gamey for a minute. Um, in terms of what you could do before nightfall, you could kind of push through this horrible choking fog to get deeper into the island if you wanted to. Um, and But then it would kind of be night when you arrived there. Um, or alternatively, you could um, you probably have enough time to jump back in the boat and get back to the sort of the mainland as far as you can tell. Um, and you would have a chance to get there before dark if you wanted to, to reconsider this. But then we'd either way we would have to figure out where, where what camp looks like, correct? Yeah. So that, don't don't worry too much about setting up camp because as long as you're not being actively stopped from doing so, you've got like camping gear and everything. So camping is fine. Um, if you're camping rather than in an actual building, um, there's a risk that your sleep will be disturbed by something potentially not good. Um, but it's generally safe. Right. I brought us to this horrible island, which as a player feels like I made a right choice. And as a character, it's like, <laughs> this was a bad choice. Um, so any, what do, do y'all have a, a preference push forward or? I think, yeah, uh, I think as knights, especially young, um, vigorous knights, we would be all for pushing forward. I'm speaking for myself. Yeah, I'm happy to push forward. Yeah, I, okay. I agree. I think this is the... Uh... We have chosen correctly. We are in the right place. So you, um, so, and like I say, as you start to push forward, this fog is really kind of, it, you can almost feel like it's kind of, like I say, it initially felt like it was kind of like cloth around you. And now it feels a bit like sort of wet cloth over your face as you walk through it. And it's almost kind of suffocating. Um, if you want to push through, you can, but it's probably going to tire you out, perhaps, and uh, take away some vigor, uh, unless you have a plan for getting through this fog. We have vigor. We just want. <laughs> some of us don't. You some could just suck it up and push through. <laughs> um, 
I get behind the vigorous ones and let them push through the fire. And so, so if you if your vigor was to get reduced to zero by something other than damage, um, you don't die that way. So you're only going to die from damage. Um, whereas yeah. a vigor loss, uh, it it is bad. Don't get me wrong, but you're not going to die. Um. Yeah, I'm happy to get behind one of these vigorous individuals and let them let them plow through this mist for me. Um, got, um, sorry, Chris. Keep on no, going. No, no, go ahead. I've got a, a long axe, so I thought I would um, take that out, like if we, as we're pushing through the mist, and like spin it around my head, just to kind of like try and disperse the mist. It's worth a go. So perhaps if you all try to kind of disperse the mist, let me see if that has any particular um, effect. You know what? It, it does seem like you are able to kind of waft some of the mist away, but it's almost like the more you waft it away, it's like it's almost fighting back against you as you've pushed through. Um, so you are going to take a little bit of a vigor loss as you go through. Uh, so let me just do that little roll uh, for you. Well, you're just each going to lose one point of vigor. So that's not too bad. Um, and that is just the exhausting pushing through, um, pushing ahead on this island. And like I say, it's as, as you get up into the mainland, uh, the, the terrain that you're passing through is this, um, it's just like a dead forest. It's almost like volcanic, like there's been a volcano here or something, but it, there's no mountains, so to speak. Uh, the trees are all black. There's these brittle roots that you're kind of stepping on and shattering to pieces as you kind of walk through. Um, and as the sun starts to come down, as you can make out through the mist, the mist does start to clear. And um, you can now sort of actually feel some fresh air sort of blowing through these trees as you as you push ahead. Um, and by the time sun, the sun is starting to come down, you, um, you have reached kind of the other side of the island. So you can see now that there is the, um, so I, I should explain what a hex is because obviously a hex is a thing on a map, but a hex is also a hex league, which is uh, the amount of distance that you can see if you're on top of a hill and the amount of distance you can walk in one phase. And it's very convenient because we can just call it a hex and then we can all pretend we're uh, immersed in the world as well. Um, so way, way to diegetically bring hex into your world. That's a really that's smart it. move. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so when you, um, as you sort of go through these woods, you, you, you've got a sense of the shape of the island by the time that um, the sun starts to come down. And you can see that there is um, the hex that you came from and there's the hex that you moved into. And then there's one more on the side. So it's kind of like an island you could kind of walk around in just over a day um, quite, quite easily. Um, however, the sun is starting to come down um, now. Um, and as you, as the sun is starting to come down, you kind of stop for a moment, perhaps, to catch your breath. Um, when, as the mist is clearing and you're kind of admiring the sunset, perhaps, a little bit, um, you notice on the horizon of this island, um, perhaps sort of at the furthest point of the island that you can see in the distance, um, there is a plume of black smoke rising upwards. Um, and the, it starts to thicken. And it starts to actually look like it's nearer, almost like it's coming towards you. Um, and from out of this black smoke, um, you see the smoke starts to turn to fire. And it's almost like the air itself is on fire in this kind of column. And from out of this fire uh, comes tumbling out this large creature perhaps kind of the size of it's kind of like like the size of an elephant perhaps but kind of longer um this huge sort of reptilian scaled creature comes tumbling out um and it's sort of lashing around and thrashing against the, the dead trees and they're sort of shattering almost like glass as this uh thing is sort of screeching and hissing and um as it comes tumbling out of the fire. Um, what do you do? Well, that seems bad. Um, 
I will say that sorry the one the one detail I missed sorry is um it's covered in scales as you would expect but no matter how much you look at it you can't quite place the color of its scales it seems to be constantly kind of changing but also you it's you just can't quite grasp uh, what color it is great um um <laughs> Uh, as dumb as this is, I'm going to throw to chance. <laughs> I'm just going to charge this thing. Uh, because if you give me an ability where there's a 50, 50 chance I die and 50, 50 chance I kill this thing, I'm either going to use it first thing or last thing. One of the two. You're immediately things. using this. And ability. apparently I'm using it. Yeah. So our, let's talk about abilities. Is this, this is an any time I can always choose to do any time. So any time that you would attack, um, the coin knight has an ability where instead they can, instead of attacking as normal. Uh, they just flip a coin, and if it's heads, they kill whatever they're trying to attack, regardless of what it is. And on tails, they die. Awesome. Um, so before you before you do that, um, what exactly does this um, attempt look like? Yeah, I think I just I I I heft out my morning star. Um, I look at my compatriots. Uh, I I all of a sudden burst around my much larger friends. <laughs> just thinking like this is my moment as a young knight to define myself um and when i say burst around i definitely mean like squeeze in between them and it's real easy because i'm real scrawny um and uh and i just i charge this thing and try to hit it um right in the right in the head with my morning star um is what what i'm trying to do here and so do you have a coin there i don't i have a d2 uh which i use i use a critical machine so does somebody want to establish whether one or two is my uh my head yeah one I guess heads. Two. one's my yeah head. i would say one is heads yeah it's a two uh, <laughs> um you, you were two. saying before how you wrote a huge backstory for your character Tony. yeah 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 i wrote a 20 page backstory for this character um let's go ahead and read that now over the uh the as the credits roll on their <laughs> Their life. Yeah, so Chris, oh. let me reverse that. What does it look like as this thing horribly destroys uh, <laughs> Sir Kittimarink, the inky dude? The well, inky it, dude. it's interesting, actually, because you, as you kind of, um, you charge forwards and you, 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 you heft your morning star and you do strike a really good blow. You strike what you think would must surely be the killing blow, which is you strike the morning star clean across this creature's head as it's kind of stooped down and kind of almost stumbling around um and but as you hit it um the blow just completely glances clean off these kind of scales of uncolor all over this creature um and the almost like the force of hitting it sort of knocks you back and the the thing that the the huge lizard thing which seemed to be sort of unaware of you before now um sort of immediately snaps to look in your direction and it just snaps forward like a snapping turtle and grabs um the coin knight and just begins to absolutely shake from side to side slamming you down into the ground and then you go down its colossal gullet um and that is the end of um K kitsmir ink the coin knight <laughs> sir kitimer ink <laughs> a, dink, a dinky dude and so and so we will we will come back to what happens to uh to you tony because we will work i'm in the quick out. start guide right now looking at how to create a new knight so don't worry yeah, you've got time to create a new knight uh while, while you're in there so i will i will trust you to do so with that um meanwhile uh the rest of you so hang on uh, what in terms of what the the creature is going to do um it's it it's sort of calmed down from its initial kind of um thrashing now now that it's perhaps had a little snack um it doesn't seem to be aware of you it seems to be sort of almost feeling around and it's sort of moving off toward um toward the water um so what are you going to do uh, sir knifed is going to to shout at it um first in the uh in the standards tongue of the land uh the one that we've all been speaking um and if it doesn't respond to that then again in the voice of horses um and i'll go friend of fafnir 
face us. You know what it is here that we can learn. Uh, give me a spirit save. So that's a d20 roll, uh, and you want to get equal or below your spirit. Excellent. My spirit is nine, and I've rolled 11, so that's a no. Okay. Um, so it sort of it doesn't seem to be responding to the words at all, but it definitely responds to the sound, um, and it will start to come uh, charging toward, uh, toward you. And... Um, in fact, before we do that, um, I would say um, the saddle knights. You, you don't you don't have any further chance to react because you've kind of invoked this. But the other two of you, um, could the other two of you make uh, clarity saves? <laughs> seeing as we're going into what looks like combat. Sure. <laughs> Holy nope. shit! I passed that. <laughs> so, Colin, you failed, and Keegan, you passed. Is that right? Yep. Uh, so, Colin, you're. You're unable to react initially, but you will get to go after the creature. Uh, Keegan, you get one chance to act before this creature. It's charging towards um, the Saddle Knight. Um, yeah, what what do you do? Uh, I guess I'll attack. <laughs> sure, go uh, for it. Yeah, I'll charge um, it with my Jagged Blade. So, you have a Jagged Blade, um, and... Without going into too much detail in combat, um, you can obviously just do a normal attack. Mm -hmm. um, but you'll notice on your character sheet, you've got three feats listed, which are Smite, Focus, and Deny. Um, you can perform these feats um, kind of at any time. So when you're attacking, you can decide to make the attack a Smite, in which case you'll roll an extra d12. Or you can add a Blast to the attack, which means it's like an area attack. Um, however, every time you use a feat, you can see there's a save underneath, and if you fail that save after you perform the feat, you'll become fatigued, which means you can't use any more feats this combat. So the first feat you use each combat always kind of works, uh, but then you have to pass the save to avoid being unable to use them. Uh, and very quickly, the, the other two feats are Focus lets you do something fancy, like a gambit, yep. and uh, Deny lets you essentially remove one of the enemy's attack dice, so that can sort of help to keep you alive. Um, so that's a long-winded way of saying, did you want to smite uh, on your attack, Keegan? Yeah, I absolutely want to smite. So in that case, what you'll do is you'll roll whatever die you've got for your weapons. So in this case, uh, you've got a jagged blade, which is D8. Your buckler as well does D4, so you've got your shield does help in combat. Cool. So you would roll a D4 as well, and you would also roll a D12 because you're smiting. So you're rolling a D4, a D8, and a D12. Cool. And I'm just adding them together. Uh, no, we're looking for the single highest die. Oh, cool. The highest is an eight. Oh, an eight. And do you have any dice that show four or more other than the eight? Uh, I do have a four as well. So um, on your character sheet, um, so in, the way the combat works is you'll use your highest die will be your damage die, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, but you can spend any of those dice. If they if there are four or more, you can spend a die to do a gambit, which is which has the effects listed at the bottom right of your character sheet. So the most obvious one is you can discard a die of four or more to boost your damage by one. So in this case, you could discard that four to increase your damage to nine. Okay. Um, yeah, let's just go ahead and bolster. That makes sense. Yeah, so that's a nine damage attack. Um, so you charge forward with your jagged blade. You sort of take a deep breath and unleash your kind of your knightly smite. However, um, these scales all over this creature's back um your blade sort of like i say as you hit it there's this kind of dull clang and you're almost just thrown back away from the attack uh even though again like with uh the coin knight strike it felt like a really good strike like it was going to be great but it just got completely deflected by these um by these scales um so now because you've used smite if you can make a vigor save yeah cool i'm good so you're fine. So you can do another one next turn if you want to. Awesome. Um, okay. So now it's the uh, the lizard's attack against uh, the saddle knight. So let's see what he's doing. Okay. So he's going to uh, lunge forward with a bite against uh, the saddle knight. And uh, so the dice that I've rolled, it's 2d10 attack. And I've rolled an eight and a five. 
So you do have the option of using deny, which is another one of the feats, to remove one of those dice and take it out of the equation. Um, uh, but if do, you do so, I do intend to, to do that. You'll have to spa yeah, you'll have to pass a spirit save to avoid um, being fatigued. But yeah, it could be good to get rid of that eight because eight is quite bad. Yes. Uh, so yeah, so I will deny the eight. Um, okay. um, probably so through five self five confidence. Points. I think. And so the point of just like probably through self confidence and kind of by, by not flinching, just kind of actually like not falling into the uh, the, the greatest strike of where it would be. Sure. Uh, so yeah, so five damage instead. I are we currently on our horses or are we on foot? That's a good question, and that's the kind of thing that I should have uh, brought up as you were traveling. But I would assume that as you were traveling, you certainly have your steeds with you because you are knights. Mm. So unless you specifically want to be on foot, I'm assuming that you are on your steeds. Um, so yeah. yeah, that does matter for the saddle knight, doesn't it, for your armor, because you've got a horseman's a rider's plate. Um, yeah. So the way so armor works is... Um, stacks with the other armor in this case, or does it replace the value here? It stacks. So basically yes. every piece of armor kind of is one point of armor. So you've got mail and rider's plate, so you've got two points of armor. Excellent. Um, uh, and I've got three guard, so that would take me exactly down to zero guard, uh, but nothing ever spilled. Well, it's funny you should say that. So yeah, damage comes off your guard first, which is very easy to get back, um, and then it will come off your vigor. Um, however, if you get reduced to exactly zero guard, you get a scar. Um, which I have rolled. So let's see what happens. So you you, you have managed to evade the worst of the damage. Um, however, let me find the scar table. And oh, okay. Um, so while you did manage to push it aside, uh, the you, you, you almost almost like intimidate it to hold back. Um, it did still manage to sort of snap its jaws around you. Um, but I think you, you managed to kind of avoid the teeth, but you still feel a crush and you're going to take a result of being ruptured, which means innards are pierced and compressed. Um, so you are going to lose 2d6 vigor as a result of that. Um, you, you can roll if you would like. Uh, I think I will. Uh, so 2d6, uh, that's a three and a four, so that's seven altogether, uh, which brings me down to three. So again, this is this isn't damage. This is bigger loss. So you wouldn't be killed by this. This is just like you're kind of being more worn down by this attack. Um, okay, so it's the the creature is at its turn. It is now the three of you all I, now. I right. still have to make a you check. Do. Sorry, yeah, I'm I spirit. denied a spirit check. Uh, spirit nine. I rolled a four, so I can still. So I'm not can still deny or use another feat again next turn. Um, so just to sum up, um, so far, any attempt to just outright hurt this thing seems to just be bouncing clean off these scales all over its back. Um, so yeah, what's, what's the plan? All three, all three of you can act. So you can, um, you can discuss what the plan is and then we'll sort of work it out together. Do we see anywhere on this creature where there aren't scales? You can see that sort of the underneath of the creature seems to be um sort of not covered by these scales it's almost like a coat all down its back and down its sort of long tail but um from what you can see like the belly looks soft yeah i was, I was thinking i might try to flip it over on its back yeah so um, to do something like that um that would be where a gambit would come into play so um if you wanted to do that with an attack uh, one of you could spend a die of four or more to try and flip it over um or at least like pry it up enough to let let somebody else come in and attack the belly. Um, if you discard a die showing eight or more, that will happen automatically. But if you just use a die showing four or more, um, the creature will get a save to try and resist that, a vigor save. And this thing looks pretty vigorous. So it's going to be a bit of a tough task to just outright flip it. Um, but obviously, if you can think of a way to kind of get it onto its back another way, um, that is another option. Could... I try to like slide under it. So the the ground here, like I say, there there are these kind of brittle roots everywhere. So the ground is kind of quite uneven. Um, if you wanted to try and get underneath it, um, I think we could say that that would be a gambit. So if you could spend a die of four or more to get under there, you could then use one of your other dice to sort of stab. 
underneath it. Um, the one thing to consider is you would then be in quite a vulnerable position directly beneath this huge creature. But um, yeah, that, that's your call. I think I'm in a great position to do that right now, honestly. <laughs> so... We're so gonna... before you do that, um, don't 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 roll any dice just yet because every anyone else who's attacking this creature, we're all going to roll at the same time. Cool. Um, because the way it works is you would all roll and take the single highest die as the damage die, but the rest of you can spend your dice to do gambits. So whether it's bolstering the attack or to do something else weird with, with a gambit. So what are the other two of you going to be doing uh, while um, the fox knight is trying to slip under? underneath this creature i'm gonna try and like prop it up or like give give a bit more leverage to lift it up or flip it over on its side to yeah. give more exposure to the belly sure um and so knife is interested in trying to keep its attention especially to draw its attention away from our fox knight um, okay so you're trying to sort of almost like I hesitate, I hesitate to use the term draw aggro, but you are trying to just like keep its attention on you. Yes, yeah, exactly that. Great, cool. Um, so I'll tell you what then. Uh, in terms of holding its attention, if you give me a spirit save, uh, we'll see whether you're able to um, to sort of hold its hold its attention. So again, spirit is nine, and it's a roll of a five. So you do manage to keep its attention, and the thing that you notice as you're doing so is it's you, you attract it by making a lot of noise, and it's from what you can see of its eyes, you kind of get the impression that it can't see, that it's following the noise of you rather than looking at you. Mm. Um, so you do hold its attention, and sure enough, it is going to come and try and eat you again. Um, but before it can get there, uh, the other two of you, uh, you can make your attack rolls. If you want to smite, um, you can do that, which again means you'll get to add a d12 to your rolls, but otherwise you'll just roll all the damage dice that you've got for the attack, and we'll, uh, we'll pull them all together uh, for the final results. Cool. I am going to smite again, just to make it clear. I try to point out, this game's really easy if you kill your character right away. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, could have been, it could have been the dream result. It could have been the dream result, and it was too good to pass up. <laughs> The meal could make it sluggish as well, so that could work in our yeah, favor. Yeah, that, that's my kind. Con- <laughs> Thanks, that's Tony. Circuit, that's Circuit Marine, the Dinky Dude's uh, <laughs> contribution to this. Uh, my next character's stats are off the wall bonkers good, though. I will say that. <laughs> so you, you saved rolling good for your character, but when it came to my character... <laughs> Yeah, I hate. Oh, no, my first one was bad, also too. That's uh, fair. I, bank, I banked all that luck, that stat luck for this guy. Right, but I also hate this character. Um, my highest roll here was a seven. Colin, what's your highest roll? Oh, I was gonna. So rather than using a smite, I was gonna attack and then use uh, try and use a gambit to position it better. Yeah, sure. So you'll, yeah. you'll so you'll still make the attack roll, but then you can use the results of that roll to do so. So, um, so have you rolled your dice? Not yet. So two two d twelve. Uh, it would be. Let me check what you've D10 got. D ten for long axe, isn't it? Okay. Uh, D ten for long axe. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a three for the long axe. Okay, so that that means you won't unfortunately be able to use that for a gambit, but. If you use the focus feet, we, we've used all three feet, but we're doing well. Um, the other feet is focus, which means you can you can perform a gambit without needing to use one of your dice. Um, but the downside is you need to make a clarity save in order or avoid becoming fatigued afterwards. So basically, the the idea is you're trying to spot an opening. So, what's your clarity again? Colin? It's four. <laughs> I mean, you can do it because it will work the first time, but you'll risk being you'll stand a good chance of being fatigued afterwards. So. So is it better off to do a smite just to get that? Uh, you would have had to declare that already, you see. Okay, okay. Um, if, if you want to say that you had smited before, I'm happy to say that because um, because we're all learning the system. So no, I'm happy. To smite... Yeah, I'm happy to, to do the um, okay. focus and uh, to try and uh, do a gambit. Okay, cool. Well, we'll come back to your gambit then. So, Keegan, you rolled a seven, and uh, did you have any other dice? Any yeah, other? I also rolled a six on that, so I will get to do a gambit as well. 
Okay, so I guess it, what that means, I guess, is, um, well, for, for the six, I'm going to say that you can use that six to kind of perform the gambit to slide underneath it. Yeah. Um, and it will get a, because you're trying to kind of trying to trick it, it will get like a clarity save to kind of avoid that, uh, which probably is not great for this thing. No, it, it, it's not got good clarity. So you are able to get underneath it and um, sort of get in with the axe. Um, Colin, were you trying to uh, help sort of lift it up to sort of aid the attack? Mm -hmm, that's right. Um, so if you're using that as a focus, I think because um, the fox net was able to slip underneath, I'd say I'm going to say we'll treat that as like a bolster. So it's more like you're just giving an extra point of damage. Okay. Um, so um, before I forget, Colin, if you can do a clarity save just to see if you become fatigued from that. I need to make a bigger save. Yeah, if you do those now. Uh, yeah, failed the save. I'm good. Okay, so Colin, you're fatigued. Um, Keegan, you're fine. Yeah. Um, so just remind me, what was the final damage total then from, from you, Keegan? Uh, with the bolster, it would have come out to eight. Eight. Um, oh, okay, interesting. Um, so you do actually manage to sink your jagged blade in underneath the belly of the creature, and you feel that it does have this soft um, kind of rubbery flesh under there. Um, and what was what? So your jagged blade is a D8, isn't it? Let me just. Um, I'll tell you what, if you can roll a D8 for me again, because you've actually caught a scar to this thing. Oh, awesome! Uh, that's two. Let me see what that means. Um, oh, interesting. Okay. Ah, well, for, you, you've caused a, a permanent disfigurement to its torso, which seems very appropriate, seeing as you've managed to, like, cut it open. Yeah, that's um, So, yeah, you've kind of gone down the, the middle of this creature's belly, and you've really sort of caused a deep wound um, within it. Um, and, yeah, sure enough, on its own turn, uh, this thing now sort of rears up and shrieks in kind of agony uh, at, the, 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 at the feel of this wound. It was completely unresponsive to all the blows to its back, but it seems like it's never felt pain before, almost, it screams out. And it sort of immediately starts to bolt towards the sea. Um, so you could give chase if you want, but it looks like it's heading towards the water. Uh, what's the plan? It did kill our friend. Now, our we friend... can always um, recover the body if we manage to... Uh... If we managed to, to get it. <laughs> like, you've begun cutting it open. We should stop it and cut, cut his body out. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we, I think we give chase. Okay. Um, well, what I'll do then is you are pro you've probably got time to get like one last attack in on this thing uh, before it gets into the water. Um, so we'll do one last kind of round of attacks. Uh, what's the plan? I'm I'm happy to do more of what we just did because that seemed to work at least. Yeah, yeah. So you're gonna try and get under it again. Yeah. Um Sean, what are you what are you doing this time? Um so I'm gonna boost Concord forward to try and as it's moving, especially if it's trying to move in a way to uh like minimize the pain it's feeling in its in its underbelly, then almost kind of like slide under like a slide round the the saddle almost like a kind of cowboy trick yeah. to try and then like rake this axe up uh up under its stomach so it's going to be a, a smiting attack from me uh so everyone can roll their attack dice that they've got if you're smiting uh you can add a d12 colin you're unfortunately fatigued so you don't get that choice um but yeah the rest of you can cool can roll. i'm gonna smite again That's great. I rolled three fours that time. <laughs> three fours? And Sean, what have you got? Uh, I got a five, a three, and a one. So five's my best. Uh, so I'm guessing that... So five is kind of the decisive blow. So, um... so I, Sorry, I got an eight on my attack. Oh, wow, well, sorry. I forgot that even though you're fatigued, obviously you can't do an attack. So yeah, the eight <laughs> is probably the decisive blow. So really for the rest of you, it depends on whether you can kind of pry up... Uh, kind of, I guess, steer, steer this creature in a way that allows... Um, uh, I, I'm I'm forgetting knight names. Uh, Colin is the Colin Sir bloody Horse. knight. Bloody knight, yeah. That allows the bloody knight to kind of get in at the side uh, with the axe. Um, so how many how many fours or more do we have from the rest of you? Three, uh, one, one from me. Yeah. And Colin, do you have any fours or more? No, I just had the one eight. 
So if we assume that you're using all of those to try and get it to uh, sort of expose its belly, um, it will get a save for each of them. And sure enough, the first attempt is kind of batted away. Uh, perhaps I guess that was um, short, uh, Sean's uh, kind of attempts uh, kind of pushed away. But then as Keegan kind of slides around and kind of you're able to maneuver the beast enough to allow the Bloody Knight to get in with the axe, um, you do manage to expose the belly. So, um, so Con, that was eight damage, did you say? Mm -hmm. uh, let me see what that means. Oof, it is a good wound underneath it. And you sort of like, as you cut into the wound, uh, as, as you cut into the belly uh, with your axe, as you sort of pull the axe away, it's almost like you pulled the axe out of a fire and there's just embers flying everywhere off your axe. And uh, rather than blood, it's like liquid fire is sort of coming out of the belly of this creature. Mm. And again, it sort of shrieks out in agony and it's sort of... Um, it's it's just bolting and it's it's still unfortunately for you able to sort of fling itself into the sea and kind of start to swim away and you see it kind of dive under the water and you see the steam rising from the from the salt water um but this sort of these drops of like blood that have been left on the sand um are kind of burning like an intense kind of phosphorus uh light um and they don't seem to be uh, going out, uh, so there is that there is now drops of fire on this uh, sand, and unfortunately, the lizard has managed to get away into the water. <sighs> so, at the very least, you're able to catch your breath, which means um, if you if you're fatigued now, you're no longer fatigued, and if you've lost any guard, uh, your guard comes back to full. Would that um, that wounds that I uh, made onto the like into the belly? And the like, the fire or the magma or whatever came out. Would that damage my axe? Uh, no, your axe is still fine. Um, but like I say, it's like almost um, you can perhaps feel a bit of heat in it. Um, okay. But your your axe is still fine. But it's yeah, it was um, it was like you were pulling it out of a a, a blacksmith's forge almost. So um, with that, uh, the lizard has gotten away. Um, the sun is coming down. I'm assuming that you're going to be uh, wanting to set up camp and you've got a fire all ready to go. <laughs> yeah, I guess here's uh, the my chart mode that dropped out of the thing's gullet just flame <laughs> on the uh, ground. Um, so are the rest of you happy to, um, to camp for the night and uh, set off again in the morning? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. Yeah, that'd be the plan. Uh, Tony, do you have your character ready? Yeah, I do. Well, well, we'll come to them in the morning because let me just check how the night is. Tony, um, have you made the ghoul night? That's I made also the, circumventing I made the entire the ghoul night. Day. <laughs> so if you're determined to end this game like instantly, aren't you? You're gonna. <laughs> um, no, I actually rolled the lance night initially, and then I was like, "Oh, there's only the first die worth of stuff in the uh, quick start. I should roll. I should roll on just that table." Um. So it's it's a relatively calm night um, around the fire. Um, you're able to, um, you know, being night, you're used to kind of living off the land. There's not much here in this kind of dead forest island, but um, you perhaps tuck into um, the dry rations that you do have for these emergencies. Um, and yeah, the you have a, a, a night of rest. Um, I should say, um, whereas guard comes back very quickly, um, in terms of restoring your virtues, like Vigor, for instance, if you've been wounded, um, on your character sheet, it should say uh, under the recovery section. So, for instance, to recover your Vigor, um, you would need to spend a full phase in hospitality, typically in an actual house with a person who's willing to put you up for the night, give you a hot meal. Um, so sleeping in a camp, unfortunately, does not count as hospitality. Um, so as the morning rolls around, a boat... Um, and arrives onto the beach um, with the fifth knight of the company who was running late this whole time. Um, Tony, who is on the boat? Uh, we've got um, Sir Clutch. Uh, oh, I shut playing... up. 
<laughs> I told you I hate this guy. Uh, I rolled the tourney night. Um, Colleen brought to life by combat, nay a protector, in fact a competitor. Um, I have a very large great lance and some javelins. Uh, some uh, I've got a fancy uh, a fancy hawk helmet that gleams in the early morning uh, sunlight. And I have a uh, a passion for hatred. Um, <laughs> this is what I have. Um, also, I was going through this, and also one of the things that we we don't get to see the knighted by, and then the different seers that you got knighted by are all very dope uh, and amazing. And just FYI, people should go if you haven't checked out the quick start yet. You should because uh, it's really great. Um, yeah, and my call to battle is duty, um, and I go by Sir Clutch. Fantastic. Um, so Sir Clutch bounds off the boat on their horse, I assume. Yeah. Um, onto the sand. Out of the horse box, onto the beach. Um, <laughs> and I say, and, what's yeah. up? So, um, so you, you now are returned to a full company of knights. It is a new morning. Let's see what the weather is like, because I love rolling on the weather table. Um, today, today's weather. Um, it is a You'll be pleased to know there is some dull fog hanging over the island. And again, this 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 island, as if it couldn't be more inhospitable. Um, the sort of the, the the choking fog was terrible, but this fog is just like draining and like dull and grey, and it's very difficult to see where you're going. Um, but yeah, you 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 are now um, you are now free to go where you want to go. So you can continue to explore this island a bit deeper into the fog. Or you can head back, I guess, towards um, where you sort of arrived on the island. I guess you have a boat now that you could get onto as well. So if you wanted to get on this boat, um, I'm sure that you could um, instead take to the water if you've seen enough of this island. I mean, this place seems to suck. I don't know whose idea it was to come here. <laughs> but if y'all want to look around, that's whatever. I think it's important that we finish what we've started and have a look. There's... Not much left of this small island. It won't take us barely half a day. Yeah, you, you figure that within the day, you could sort of get to the bit of the island you've not seen and then get back to uh, back to the original bit where you landed. You could kind of complete your circuit of the island, if you like. I mean, like I said, it's whatever. Let's do it. So you, um, as you sort of uh, travel through this dull fog into the, um, into the kind of murk of this island... Um, you you get to a, a, again this this kind of dead wood it already looks kind of burnt up um but you get to a stretch of uh forest that is sort of completely um completely reduced to ash it is just like the the, the trees are there and then all of a sudden it's like a wall and the, the forest is just burned to the ground in this kind of gray ash um and among the sort of uh piles of ash uh, you can see a silver-haired figure um, sc sort of scooping up the ash and kind of um, putting it into a sack very carefully. Um, and yeah, he doesn't seem to have noticed you, but you can see him doing that. What sort of garments is he wearing or like what, what is he, yeah, what kind of figure does he cut? Um, so he is wearing like a black kind of gambeson, like sort of padded armor. Um, but he doesn't look like a soldier as such. Um, if you if you were generalizing, you might think that he is some kind of bandit. Um, but but who are we to know just from first in, uh, appearances? Um, yeah, he's he's kind of like like I say, he's got this long silver hair, and he looks like he's sort of probably nearing kind of older age. Uh, but he still looks in red. He seems to be moving around at a good pace, kind of gathering up this ash. Would we be able to recognize a knight if we saw one, like from just not kind of necessarily? No, if you were perhaps talking to them, but um, knights come in kind of all appearances, really. So it's um, it's not always immediately obvious. The fact that he doesn't have a steed would suggest that maybe he's not a knight, um, but that's not always a, a guarantee. Um. Uh. What's up? So he kind of turns around and he kind of uh, looks over and kind of squints through the fog and uh, he kind of notices the four knights um, and he sort of like 
almost like sneaks over to you and he says knights what 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 brings you here good knights we're looking for another knight there there are lots of knights in this realm we seek the ghoul knight <clears throat> let me see let me see um the ghoul knight um i no, I, I know that the um he, he sort of gestures to the south and he says, um if you're looking for the dust knight, um Ebramir is to the south on the mainland. Um that's the holding of the dust knight. Um, but I, I don't know any ghoul knight. Uh do knights know other knights well? Is that like from a realm? Is that not well? The thing is, if if let's say that the um, yeah, two two knights that sort of like lived in the same realm and both ruled a holding would probably know each other. Um, sort of traveling, wandering knights, perhaps not so much. Um. Anyway, he seems kind of in as you're sort of as he's talking to you, he's, he sort of keeps looking back towards the ash and he sort of says, um, "Yeah, so so you'll be wanting to get on, I would imagine. Safe travels to you." And he's kind of like waving already. Uh, what's the what's the deal with the ash? Oh, um, it's um, it's it's useful for remedies. What useful, sort of... useful remedies, not not harmful remedies. Useful remedies. Huh. It's interesting we didn't ask that question. <laughs> uh, there, 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 there's plenty. By by all means, help yourself. I'm just I'm just stocking up so that I can. Um, um, I tell you what. Give me who's who's currently talking. To you? I think Keegan, you were sort of um, initiating yeah. that. Give, give me a spirit save, please. Oh yeah, I'll I'll do great on this. <laughs> Just to see whether this guy takes a liking to you, I guess. I don't know how I rolled that. Uh, yeah, I rolled. If if is it meets it beats it. Oh yeah, no, if it, uh, equal or below. Oh cool. Uh, I made that somehow. I rolled a awesome. three against my <laughs> clarity or my spirit of three. <laughs> so for some reason, this guy kind of seems to like seems to trust you for some reason, um, and he says, um, "Look." Um, Okay, okay. I, I'm telling you this because I, I don't want... I, I want to help knights. I think you do an important job in the realm. Um, the, this this ash, um, it was... It, it's, it's ash from the fire of the lizard, and it can create an incredibly deadly poison. Now, I'm, I'm gathering it for safe holding so that nobody who has malicious intent would um, be able to make... A very deadly poison. I thought it best that I take it into safe holding myself. So, um, so if you do take this ash, um, just be very careful because it can be used to make um, an incredibly deadly poison. Yeah, why don't I hold on to it for safekeeping? It seems by all means uh, help you help yourself. There's there's plenty to go around. You know, I'll take I'll take the stuff you've collected already. It seems safe. Oh, um, your hands. okay. He kind of like sheepishly like hands over the sack. Thank you. And then um, you can see that sort of the cogs turning in his head. And he says, um, well, it's it's just that I, I was actually hoping um, I was hoping that um, just one. I, I, I've just got one one job left. I've done some bad things in my life and I have one job left to do. Please, can you let me keep this ash for the last job? And then I'm going to retire a happy man. Look, this will make a lot of poison. There's lots of bad things in the realm that that might need to die. I I don't. Think... Did you not take an oath to protect the realm? <laughs> yes, and I will protect the realm. He sort of you can see him kind of um, getting annoyed almost with his own uh, his own arguments, and he kind of like yeah he he hands over the sack to you, and kind of um, and says right well. Okay, I, I guess I'll be on my way then, and you can be on your way, and we can leave it there. Sounds great. 
I have one more question for you, grandfather. How did you avoid the lizard? We chanced upon it before we slept last night and it it ate one of our company. The little one. What are your Ooh, secrets? Um well I, I, I know I know the stories. Um so I I I had heard the story that the um when the when the fire comes out of the sky and the, the lizard is born, um trees that are killed by the fire, uh, trees that are burnt by the fire, um it can be used to make the remedies that we were talking about. Um but uh, no, I, I didn't see the lizard. I, I waited until um I waited until the commotion had died down and uh, then I just followed the, the, the trail of the fire. A true honorable choice there. Well done. He kind and, of bowed uh, you. <laughs> thank you for your hospitality here. So he is going to um unless you have any further business with him, he kind of seems to be keen to head back towards, he's got like a small little two-person rowboat on the shore. Are you going to let him trudge off? Yeah, that sounds great. So he kind of goes away. You see him kind of looking back at the big piles of ash for a moment, and then he kind of thinks better of it, and he kind of hops into the boat and starts to kind of row himself um, back away. Um, so that is the end of the morning phase. Um, the sun is about as high in the sky as it can get. And uh, you've now kind of seen the whole of the island. I guess you've seen every hex of the island. But a hex is quite a large area. So um, you could sort of continue to um, to dig around in this island and there might be more to find. Um, or if you wanted to head back to the coast where there was a boat, um, you could get back there just in time for nightfall. A uh, question for you, real quick. Um, sure. I know we have a, we all have like a passion or whatever, and my yeah. What does that do? <laughs> so, um, the like I said about your virtues being reduced. If your virtues are reduced, um, you can recover them. Mm. It's a slightly different way for each each virtue. So we said that for vigor, um, hospitality would kind of let you replenish your vigor. Um, if your clarity gets reduced, you can replenish that by receiving guidance from a seer. Um, and spirit, that uh, is the one that is uh, okay. recovered by your passion. Cool, cool. So your particular passion will be something where if you kind of do that, and I'm, you know, it's your kind of call when you feel like you've achieved it, um, you can replenish your spirit if your spirit has been reduced. Cool, cool. I was like, I feel like I fooled an attempt at being tricked, but uh, my spirit's not down. So <laughs> yeah. So if your if your spirit had been reduced beforehand, uh, I, I would say, yeah, you're great. Go for it. Okay. Cool. Cool. Oh, cool. Uh, so, I mean, I'm I'm a big fan of of not digging around in the dirt, the ash more than we need to at this point in time. Does um, Does it look like there are any like um, uh, grave sites or graveyards or anything like that in the area? So far on this island, you've not come across any signs of like inhabitants at all. There is one dead body you're aware of. <laughs> well, yeah. it's no longer on the island. <laughs> yeah, circling the island. Uh, um, we have we've got a guide now or at least a, a place that we can go and ask we've got a um a known holding to the south that presumably we'll be able to see when we get onto the mainland yeah and i yeah. imagine that we could ask the uh ask the dust knight yeah i'm happy with that plan so we're heading back that way mm -hmm. yeah i'd like to scatter this ash a little bit before we leave just in case he rows back when he sees a sleeve you want to say a few words so yeah, you spend a bit of time making it more difficult for him and just kind of, uh, yeah, yeah, spreading it around as best you can. Um, there's, so there's quite a lot of it. So you, you get the impression that if he's really determined, he could probably come back and get it, but um, it might just put him off, yeah. Yeah. Um, so you sort of uh, get back on your steed and you're kind of riding kind of, I guess, like south towards like that end of the island where you arrived. Um, and let's see what you get. Um Okay, so heading back, you kind of you kind of circled the island, um, and you're coming back. Although you're going back to a position you've been to, you're going you're coming kind of from a different direction. Um, so as you are um, crossing the um, as you're crossing into kind of the the neighbouring hex, um, you spot a at a distance what looks like a river kind of flowing toward the sea, obviously. Um, but um, as you get closer, you can see that the rather than 
rather than water it's just kind of flowing like a gray sludge almost like it's saturated with this ash um from the kind of the burnt forest um and within the kind of um within the ash you can make out there's some creatures in there like maybe like the size of like a small dog um they look like kind of lizard like creatures in in the kind of ash saturated water flailing about and kind of looking very pained and struggling in the water like they're kind of in agony and there's two of these creatures does it look and like no the... one else goes to goes to stop him then uh so knife is probably going to essentially like euthanize the the things and like appears they appear to be in great pain in the environment they're in and uh part of my uh my I talk to horses thing is to recognize when there is an animal in pain and reduce its pain as best as I can. Uh, and uh, when 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 all you have is an axe, uh, every problem looks like a nail. So when you get closer, you can see that the river itself is kind of like there's lots of like dead fish and dead animals in the water um, that's, that's sort of flowing through. And these two creatures, they kind of they pulled themselves up onto the bank and they are like I say, flailing around in agony. You actually recognize the sort of species. Um, they are what's known as a nightly salamander. Um, and one of the things that they are sort of famed for, these salamanders, is that they are sort of immune to immune to the venom of, of other animals normally and immune to any sort of toxin and incredibly hardy creatures. Um, but they are kind of flailing around in this water. And sure enough, I'm happy to... Um, have the camera pan away as the axe falls down but um but yeah you sort of put them out of their misery um these kind of these noble creatures um so yeah any other business with this horrible sludge river um i mean it feels like we should collect some of that horrible that sludge. sludge um sounds like it might come in handy later so you have this kind of sack of the ash already that you confiscated from the um I thought you, did, did you spread that or did you spread the rest of it? Katie? No, I'm holding on to the sack of ash. Okay. I've, I spread the random shit on the beach. Cool. So it uh, looks very similar to that. It looks almost like the stuff that you've already collected, just like is in it, the river water itself. It looks like making a remedy is combining this ash with with liquid potentially, and that does the <laughs> trick. Is that is that what we're gathering? That, that's the impression you get, certainly. Cool. Well, then, um, yeah, we're good. But yeah, so you kind of like you ride on from this horrible scene, and um, and sure enough, you sort of hit the um, the south coast of this island um, in time for nightfall. Um, and yeah, so uh, I'm guessing you'll want to set up camp for the night before setting off uh, for the mainland in the morning. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So you set up your camp again. You're probably down to like your horrible travel food rather than finding anything nice to eat in on this island uh but let's see how your night's sleep is it's it's remarkably quiet um on this island there doesn't seem to be any like life happening on here at all at the minute don't worry um, i fill and... the silence with regaling you with stories of my latest victory uh, <laughs> i can was, was it a, was it a well-earned victory do what was it a, a good victory yeah the last one was great great so, i am um, I have a chat with with your horse uh, about whether or not that's true. <laughs> <laughs> you can't hear the horse back. You can only talk to the horse. Oh no! <laughs> if, if it was a good victory, knock twice. Blink once for it's a yes. Nay. <laughs> um, I feel like because okay. Of the um, oh, hang on. I'm, I'm getting a I'm getting a, an error message. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Cool. We're good. Um, okay. So sure enough. The next morning comes around and um i'm guessing you're going to want to hop in the boat and sort of head for the head south towards the mainland where you are told this holding of ebramia is where you might be able to find the uh, dust knight yeah keegan, um, you who at the very least while... would presumably know the area had you wanted to do something while it was night keegan oh i was just going to mention that while it's night my uh steed does have dark vision does that <laughs> does that change anything um i guess you can put your <laughs> steed on like watch <laughs> Perfect, cool. Yeah, you're you're the tunnel steed, isn't it? So yeah. I'm assuming like yeah, red for um tunnels. 
Um, good, good, important to bring it up anytime there's dark. Yeah, anytime so. it's dark, I need to bring up that the tunnels need dark vision. That's okay. um, but yeah, I think we are pushing across the 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 you know uh, the water to the dust towards the dust knights holding. Okay, um, so it's a very it's it's quite a short channel between these two islands, so it actually sort of doesn't take you much time at all to get over to the mainland and you'll be pleased to know that the, you, you're very much leaving the fog behind you as you kind of pass through and you're actually able to see some blue sky, some sun rising, um, a few sort of scattered pink clouds in the sky. Um, and yeah, you, the, 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 the sea is a little bit more lively than before. You've, you've got some rolling waves, but, um, but before long, um, sort of by like late morning, you're kind of able to wash up on the, um, on the mainland. And it's, it's these very sharp, craggy rocks um sort of not not like cliff faces so you, you can get into docked boat but um but it's quite kind of hard going to get through it and it's almost like a sort of maze of these crags to travel through so um you manage to get far enough uh inland that you reach a kind of a bit of a vantage point um up amid all these rocks um and let me just see okay you're fine um, and you get a bit of a vantage point so that by midday, you've got a little bit of the lay of the land in front of you. And you can see, sure enough, to the south of you, um, you can see a bright sort of white stone citadel um, sort of nestled in among the craggy rocks. So a kind of an isolated kind of tower. And then you can make out a kind of low wall around it and, um, and a few, some sort of buildings scattered within, uh, within the, the walled kind of settlement um so presumably this would be the holding um of dust knights um you can also see um that the land does extend to both your east and your west sorry to the east and the west and uh to the west you can just about make out something bear with me yeah enhance um so you look you look to the west and it's it's just incredibly dark in that area um and you look to the sky and it's not like that there's no like it, it's almost like when there's like a thundercloud hovering over a patch of land that you can sort of look over and it's like it's in the shade um there's no cloud in the sky but the all that kind of area of craggy rocks appears to be like in the shade and very dark um al almost to the point you can't see into it um so yeah so that seems nice <laughs> fun times um so i should say sorry for distances sake you reckon you could get to ebramir if you were to head down that way um easily in time for for sunset yeah that sounds great we should do that great so you um sort of try and navigate this kind of labyrinth of like craggy rocks uh, as you're heading towards the uh, the citadel on the horizon um and yeah it's it's pretty pretty safe going as you get closer you start to eventually come across um what passes for like very um rough trails so the journey becomes a bit easier and yeah sure enough you arrive at the walls of this settlement um and the gates are currently um closed um but there is that there are sort of two little watchtowers on the side of the gates um it's just kind of a wooden rampart really and um there are a couple of guards atop the um, atop each of the watchtowers, kind of looking down as you approach. Um, and sure enough, they they would perhaps sort of recognise you as knights because before you even get close enough to, to speak to them, um, they kind of signal for the gates to open, and these wood big wooden gates kind of creak open, and you can sort of ride into the uh, into the holding itself. Um, so Ebramir itself uh, inside the walls. Um, like I say, there's a few sort of like normally in a holding, there's like the main keep, and then there's like the places where the vassals live, just like where the regular commoners live in just like modest houses uh, scattered around inside this kind of small walled settlement. Um, there is a larger building, uh, a, a larger kind of stone building with kind of like a, do a stone dome um, separate to the citadel, but the citadel itself is this kind of like tall white tower. Um, and yeah, as, as far as you can tell, um, that would presumably be the place to find the dust knight if you wanted to go and uh, find out what's going on. 
Um, but let me know if there's anything else you wanted to do or speak to any of the, the commoners or check out this other stone building, uh, that they would also be options. Is there any, is there any protocol? Cause like if this guy has a holding that makes him a station of night above us, correct? Yeah. So the, uh, you can see on your character sheet, there's different ranks of night that are sort of like based on the glory that you've achieved. Um, so a knight that holds a holding would normally be at least a knight tenant. So they're kind of like two ranks above you out of the five ranks of knights, I guess. But it doesn't it doesn't mean as such that they can like order you around. It's just kind of they are a bit more, they've just achieved a bit more in their life than you. Okay. Uh, they're ahead of you on the ladder, I guess, but they're not like they don't have any authority over you. Okay. Have we heard about this dust knight or do we know of his of his renown? Uh, you don't know anything about them other than just what the uh, the bandit the fact that the bandit told you that they are down here, um, but yeah, you know nothing else about the dust knight. Um, but by all means, like I say, there's there's people milling around, uh, there's farmers, there's like a, perhaps like a workshop and like some kind of basic facilities in this in this settlement. So you could just sort of ask around about the dust knight, but also that might be, come across as a little bit suspicious rather than going and just talking to them yourself. Yeah, if you three want to go look for the knight, that would make a lot of sense, I think. Just thinking about the um the ghoul knight too, like is there a um a graveyard or a grave tender or anything in this uh settlement? Um you would you would sort of assume that most settlements have some kind of either graveyard or like some mounds nearby or something. Um so yeah, if, I, I guess if if you kind of were looking out for that particularly, uh, perhaps let's say you noticed some burial mounds outside the sort of the town walls itself. So let's say that's kind of common practice for here. But it, it wasn't kind of like a, a built-up area; it was kind mm. of just like a separate little area to the to the holding. Well, clearly the uh, the dust knight will know we're here. I think we should head straight straight to his keep and introduce ourselves after all we are all bound to the seers okay so um as you yeah if, if you're going to head up to the uh, citadel itself uh, like i say the sun's kind of coming down now so we're kind of maybe getting into sunset um but it's still kind of reasonable time to go and uh, knock on uh yeah you, you sort of head up into the uh, citadel i'm assuming you're happy to leave your steeds um sort of um what's the word not tied up that's bad um moored moored is a boat what do you do to a what do you do to a horse i think you tie him up <laughs> yeah. yeah you you, you, <laughs> you you leave your horse in the appropriate place you can tell there was immense research gone into this game <laughs> um yeah you kind of leave your horse your steeds outside and you head up the stairs into the citadel and inside the citadel itself um the the sort of the big kind of main hall area um there are sort of shields all down the um all down the length of the hall um and each of the shields you can see have been kind of broken and sort of put back together for for display and they all have different kind of heraldry on them and they're all different shapes and sizes um, and hanging from the roof of each, uh, hanging from the ceiling of the uh, the long hall, sorry, the round hall, I guess, for the citadel. Um, hanging from the ceiling is a large uh, sort of chandelier with um, big kind of uh, torches, kind of burning, sort of uh, casting a warm light around the room. And um, at the centre of the room, um, there is a. Um, you can see there's a table with quite a kind of grand wooden chair behind it. And there is a man, an older man, um, sort of sat in this chair and he's having an argument with um, another uh, a sort of an older woman who's with him. Um, and as you kind of get close, enough, you can kind of make out that the uh, the man who you can kind of you can see is dressed in kind of armor and kind of the trappings of a knight. Um, you can see that he um, he's carrying this this large kind of like warhammer. And he's kind of like banging it against the table as he argues with this, um, this uh, older woman who is dressed in kind of, uh, I guess, like the clothes of a, a courtier. So she's wearing um, sort of quite fine clothes um, and she's holding like a, some, some scrolls and kind of arguing with him. And they seem to be arguing about something to do. 
so it 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 seems like it's to do with um it's something to do with livestock, but you can't you can't work out the 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 meaning of the um the argument because as you get close enough, uh, the sort of the, the woman notices the four of you come in and kind of stops and sort of gestures to the to the older man and kind of takes a leave. Um, and the old man sort of looks up to the three of you, and he's got a very kind of harsh, kind of sharp features. Um, he's clearly old and he's got sort of short gray hair and a very kind of haggard face but he still looks you know in good um good form and good health um and he kind of looks over the three of you and says knights from another realm to what do i owe this pleasure um we're here seeking the ghoul knight <laughs> that was the same, right? You know you're in Evremia, which is the home of the Dust Knight. Do you understand that, son? Yes, of course. I would... To be more specific, we were hoping you had more information on him. Can you give me a spirit save, please? <laughs> yeah, I filled that one. You enter my hall and you start asking me about... The ghoul knights, like I am some kind of seer, that I can see the present and the future and the past. Does that sound like a knight to you, or does that sound like a seer? I, I should cast you out of my hall straight away. Who is this fool? We we assumed that an established knight like yourself might that there might be a seer nearby that you would established. Be aware of. Oh, established. Oh, I thank you for your kind words, good knight. I feel I feel so so vindicated that my life of service has has reached your ears. Thank you. He kind of reaches into his um into his pouch and kind of uh, throws down like a satchel on the table and opens it up and um out of it he pulls like there's like all this dried dried fish essentially. And he kind of scatters it over the table and uh, picks one up himself and starts to munch on this kind of fish jerky. And he says, help yourselves. I love this guy. I'll just dig uh, in. I hate this like, man. It's <laughs> <laughs> only so because he told you off the sarcasm night, says Dan. And um, Jen. Any um, of you who do talk into the fish, um, it's very salty. It's very smoky um it's it's kind of nourishing but it's whether it's the combination of this guy just berating you or the fish you start to feel like a kind of sadness in your stomach just from being here yeah I mean, um so yeah he's he, he seems kind of not thrilled with with the way this is going um i'm guessing so is the intent to try and find out about the ghoul knight yeah, or find somebody else who can help us. Uh, I, and I'll just, after chewing on some fish, be like, I mean, yeah, I guess if you're not able to help us, that's fine. We'll we'll keep on our way. I mean, you know, we just we just assumed that there was something of worth here. Yeah, I mean, we all, I think, assumed you kept appraised of your own land, but I guess the, the offense is ours. The, the ghoul knights had nothing to do with my lands. I have these lands here. Have you, have you seen the landscape outside? Does it look like an easy land to run? Maybe if it was done lush, well. Lush farmland, did you see as you arrived? The rolling the rolling meadows of Ebramir? No, it's a tough land, and I am the only one who can look after this land. But if you seek the ghoul knight and uh, whatever he does with his territory, um, you'll you'll want to head west. All the way west, the other side of the realm. Thank God, because he, he, his realm, his lands are nowhere near mine. Hmm, so you did know where he was. Um, ah, but perhaps not where he is now. For but of course, course you I, are no I, I, I respect the victims of hospitality. So I'll have a room made up, and um, I'll say good day to you. And he kind of hits the table with his hammer and um, marches off to go and shout at somebody else. Um, but yeah, you can kind of generally expect to get hospitality at most places, uh, even when the welcome isn't especially warm. Um, so unless you have any business with him, you're going to let him kind of march off for now? Yeah, I, <laughs> I, think, I think we're good <laughs> with Dust Knight. I think he's, his nightly days are behind him and he's just a bureaucrat now. Yeah. 
Are you, are you going to say that behind him as he walks away? Yeah, I will. <laughs> <laughs> well, perhaps his hearing isn't as good as it used to be. Um, so yeah, um, just despite that, the the rest of the kind of his his court are all very welcoming, and you know, it's um, like I say that they're they're actually much more helpful than the Dust Knights. And in kind of like preparing you food, you're able to talk to some people and get a general sense of the kind of the layout of the realm. And um, yeah, the advice that you're given is. Um, the Ghoul Knights, his holding, which is called uh, Larfell Bridge, um, his holding is all the way on the other side of the realm. And the the fastest way to get there uh, would be to take a boat um, all the way across the sea, sort of following the coast of this realm, um, all the way to Larfell Bridge. And it would be, let me run the numbers. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it's kind of two days travel by boat to get there if you take a boat directly um, there um, and there there are boats sort of that go from there are boats that are sort of able to go from here but you would need to have the approval of the dust knight to send one of his boats um, out to do it uh, the other option is to trudge around on land or to get a shorter boat kind of over there's a little channel of water and you could do a kind of half and half if you just want to take a short boat ride and then walk the rest of the way. But um, but yeah, to get an actual boat all the way around, um, you'd need the Dust Knight to approve one of his uh, boats to go out. Well, my suspicion is that with all of those broken shields, the Dust Knight himself has kind of probably got a history of, uh, of jousting. And uh, and perhaps in this case, Sir Clutch might, uh, might offer a game and uh, with the uh, with if you win, then perhaps we might be getting a, get a free ride on these boats. That might be a so long. You could you could challenge him to a to a joust. Is that is that a normal night thing? Like we're, we're yeah, they love it. Happens. It's okay, um, great. I do. He, I'm he's not kind of like he's not obliged to accept, but it's kind of like considered kind of poor form to to not accept, or at oh, least yeah. put forward a champion if he's uh, if he's not up for fighting himself. No, I think that's great then. But, because, but a lot of broken shields lifted up there. Yeah, it's, either it's up for a good fight. Either I get to do this, or we get to embarrass this dude. So one of the, one of the, <laughs> one of the either way, it's a win. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we'll we'll, you know, um, he's he's trotted off. So is there anything else we want to do other than that, or is that? Is that I the do play? think I want to find the courier. He was like arguing with a moment ago and just see what that was about yeah sure so so she seems very busy um you see so you see her like darting around talking to lots of people um but yeah you're, you're able to catch her um at some point in the evening before you all head off to get some sleep and um you sort of you know you ask sort of politely like you know how whether there's problems in the realm sorry in the in the holding i should say and um it sounds like what you're able to get is that there have been um, there's been like raiders coming in and um, stealing livestock from here. Um, so the it's they're, they're not quite in like famine territory yet, but um, you get the impression there's like there's problems with the, the realm isn't particularly comfortable at the moment with their sort of food supplies and their livestock. And um, it was kind of disguised raiders. It wasn't even just like sort of you know raiders might come in from the sea it was um they were like clearly disguising themselves and they they got away with a good amount of livestock and it's yeah it's not been good for them. okay cool good to know that might be another option if uh if the dust knight turns down our our request for jousting or if he's not interested to say like we can take care of the raiders in exchange for transport yeah um so let's say that you've managed to get some hot food. Um, you get like a a nice fish stew, much nicer than the um, the horrible salted fish that you're given by the the dust knight. Um, and uh, yeah, it's you you're given a nice soft bed in an actual building, which means you are able to restore your vigor um, up to its full amount. Um, and yeah, so the next morning, uh, it sounds like you've got a few options. Which one are you going to go for? Um, I mean, I'm going to challenge. I mean, I, I wrote out a nice, a nice formal challenge the night before because <laughs> um, it's it's it. I love it. I'm into it. Um, and uh, I I probably sent somebody the previous evening 
with the challenge to to the Dust Knight so he could prepare himself first thing. Yeah, perhaps you found one of his squires and you sort of issued the formal challenge. Let me see what he's going to make of that. Bear with me. Okay. Um, okay. So, I've got it. Um, he, the next day, um, you're sort of eating your breakfast at one of the tables in the hall. Uh, there's lots of people around, milling around in the court. Um, and the dust knight comes, slams the door open, comes marching into the room, looks over the, uh, the four of you, and he sort of uh, says, which one of you is the tawny knight? <laughs> <laughs> I just love how it's panning across over to the four, three of us, or the four of us, and it's very obvious which one the tourney night is. Um, 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 that would be me. So you you want to ju- you want to joust for if you win, I will grant you passage on one of my ships, of which I have plenty, but also not enough to waste. Um, one of my ships will carry you to uh, to Laughel Bridge. Do I do I have this right? Yes. And if 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 I win the duel, uh, what what is what is my motivation to do is other than putting a young knight in his place? I, mean, I guess we'll take care of the bandits that you don't seem to be able to handle. What 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 bandits are you talking about? Oh, uh, I'm sorry. What, did we miss here about the the livestock that was absconded with? I'll 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 do you a I'll do you a better deal. And he sort of looks and presumably you're not wearing your helm, but let's say you've got your kind of fancy helm yeah. with you. If I beat you in the in the joust, I will take your helm, I will break it and mount it on the wall. Sure. Um so he kind of he kind of storms off to get his um armoring gear. Um his squire comes out and kind of sheepishly says to you. Okay. Um, the the conditions the conditions for the duel, and he kind of gets out a scroll. Uh, the conditions for the joust are: it will be, um, it will be three three tilts, and then um, the, uh, the, the 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 contest will be judged uh, by the dust knight to to see who who performed best in the in the in the joust. Great. So I just got to kill the dust knight. Is what I <laughs> Um, uh, uh, oh, and uh, you, you would sort of, you would probably assume that unless you'd sort of stated that it was like to the death or to the blood, that it's going to oh, yeah. be using like blunted lances or something. Yeah, like yeah, you can yeah. use your lance, yeah, yeah. but it will be a non-lethal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, 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 no. Unless... I, I, I assume. Unless. <laughs> um, you, you can definitely mess him up, but yeah, it's not going to be um, lethal. Is that normal? Does that seem like, this doesn't seem like a sporting thing. It, it, it's I, it's the standard uh, protocol for um, for a joust here in Evermere. In Evermere, right? Um, yeah. but, and and, but, and uh, the, the the lord of the lord of the house has a has a fantastic record. I will say, does he? Um, is it? But it's not necessarily outside of here. Is that correct? No, well, the the the, the jousts all take place um, on on Highbridge. Uh, so, you know, and, and I, mean, I mean, other in other places, it's not normal that the person you're jousting uh, gets to decide whether whether you won or lost. But he he is a man of honor. He is a knight. He would not lie, and he would he would judge it fairly. Sure. <laughs> um, you can him. This sounds quite great. obvious. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm, he kind of gestures up, and you can see that in in amongst two of the sort of higher crags, kind of like a, a short kind of walk up upwards into the mountains. Um, you can see like there's a narrow bridge almost between two crags, and uh, that's where he's gesturing that the the joust is going to take place. I love how it's not to the death, but if we fall off of this thing, we'll obviously die. That's great. Well, it won't, um, it won't have been the joust that killed you. It was yeah, it's not the it's the fall that kills you. Yeah. Um, no, that's great. I love this. This is wonderful. Let's see how many characters I can get through. That's the real question. <laughs> so let, let's yeah. assume that this is happening in the um, in the afternoon of the day. Yeah. So he's got a little bit of time to prepare. Was there anything else you wanted to do in the morning before um, before the joust? Yes. I would like to go find some of the farmers and like laborers who potentially lost their like livestock and whatnot and just gossip uh, <laughs> about yeah, yeah. how 
this old dust knight is um could be protecting them and their livestock and is instead uh jousting with <laughs> this like young tourney knight and you know obviously he's not good for this holding anymore i just i just want to start shit with this man that's all yeah yeah foment some rebellion yeah. So in in sort of in spreading this shit around, um, you managed to kind of get a few people to, quite a few people were quite keen to join in when you started like, you know, when you start like talking about someone behind the yeah. back and you can tell the other person's just itching to join in. <laughs> um, you got that impression a little bit as well. Um, and the the kind of impression that you get is that um, that this this person this knight was you know a very good knight that he he kind of fought his way to to um to the position he's at now and he protected the realm and he did lots of great things and it's a very difficult land around here um but as he's gotten older he's gotten um perhaps distracted by other things and is kind of almost like he's, he's become so defiant about protecting his reputation um that he's getting distracted from actually managing the realm um so yeah it's it but that's the kind of the vibe that you get um that he's perhaps past his prime and kind of trying to go out swinging a little bit. Incredible, cool. Uh, Colin and Sean, did you did you have anything you wanted to do this morning? Uh, I was going to offer to to look over um, look over the horses before things go on, um, but as part of that, also offer up uh, Sir Clutch. My uh, like, I've, I've got a very good saddle. Um, and uh, and if you want to use my saddle, you, you can't be knocked off if you don't want to fall off. So uh... yeah, you can you can definitely um, put your incredibly good uh, saddle uh, to use that way for sure. And, and you are currently muted, which is why we. Can't I'd be, I mean, I'd be I'd be honored. I mean, you know, gear gear doesn't make a victor, but it can certainly uh, help lean things in your favor one way or the other. Um, so let me just, uh, before we get into that, so, uh, you, the Tawny Knight has an ability where, yeah, if there's a prize in the combat, you'll basically get plus D6 to all your main yeah, attacks. Yeah, great. If this would qualify. Um, was there anything else you wanted to do, uh, before sort of, uh, riding up to this bridge for the, for the joust? No, I don't think, I mean, I, you know, I spend the morning preparing for the joust. I don't think there's anything else I'm particularly looking to do. Cool. Um, so uh, there's, there's a bit of a crowd gathering up there. The locals, even though they kind of they seem a bit cool on the dusk night overall, uh, people do will turn out for a tournament or a fight because it's it's one of the best forms of entertainment that they've got here. Um, and yeah, let me um, let me just pull up the dusk night. So I've got him here. Okay, that's. Fine. Okay. Um, so, as the dust knight, you see, as you as you approach um, the the bridge, you can see the dust knight is um, is sort of already ready at one end of the bridge. Um, he has his kind of hammer on his back that he was slamming against the um, against the table, but he's also got a lance for the duel, um, and he has a, a shield that has a sort of a very it's it's sort of a thick thick wooden shield with like metal plating on it and it's got like a it's got lots of little tiny words inscripted on it you can't kind of read it from here but it's got a, a a large inscription on it um and he's riding his uh steed which kind of has like faint kind of white dots dots down it, almost like a dappled steed um and it's it's his steed is standing very tall and proud and you can almost feel like your horse like wanting to go at this horse like your horse hates this horse we get um, it we get it buddy and um yeah so that that he's he's there kind of ready and there's a crowd waiting uh so i guess without any further um delay uh, are we happy to start the joust yeah does this is, is does this work differently or is this just a normal-ish combat so the way it will work differently is you will both roll your attacks together and we'll resolve them simultaneously Okay. Do um, we... and there will be three passes, which means there'll be three rounds essentially. Awesome. Defeats and gambits. Does anything come in, or is it? Yeah, you can you can do feats, gambits. You can do anything you would normally do. That's awesome. Uh, I combat, would make but it, it will all happen simultaneously. So let's yeah. say, for instance, you used a gambit to try and disarm him. 
um, he would still get to do his attack before he was disarmed because it's all happening simultaneously. Gotcha. Um, um, I was I was making a new character when you were explaining combat originally, so <laughs> let's walk through. <laughs> yeah. So, so you've got. Um, so you've got your um what weapons do you have? You have a lance. I have a weapon. great lance that's um uh and I've got some javelins uh also too, which feel like not sporting to you. So I'm using the great lance. Great. And um that is it's a long weapon, isn't it? The great lance. Is that right? It's it's pretty great. Uh, I'm it, it says hefty. Oh yeah, so it's hefty. I mean she she can wield it in one hand. Did you want to borrow someone's shield or request a shield from somewhere? Um, because you don't have a shield, you, you can obviously ascertain one. Um, uh, no, I don't think so. Okay, <laughs> so you'll be going into it. this. You've got your gambeson and your arena plate and your fancy helm, so you'll have armor three for this. Yep. Um, or, the... and then I borrowed something from from uh from uh Sir Nave. What was what did I borrow from you? Is it just the saddle? So, yeah, so the uh. The saddle and tack that I've got is uh, you can't be dismounted whilst you're in it. Okay. Great. Um, so what we'll do is we'll roll... Well, so you, the option you have before rolling is you can choose to smite if you wanted to smite, um, which means you'll roll an extra d12 damage, um, but then you'll have to pass a vigor save to avoid avoid being fatigued afterwards. Yeah. And fatigued just means you can't use any more feats. Right. Um, it's worth knowing that as a knight... All knights know those three feats. So the Dutch yeah. knight will know these feats as well. Yeah. Um, so I, I'll tell you now that he's definitely going to try and smite you with his first attack. Even um, though even though they we're not trying to hurt each other too much. It's, not, it's, it's a nice, it's a it's a sporting smite. That's fine. Um, that sounds great. Um, I'm I'm gonna try to perform a gambit. Uh I'm gonna focus. Uh, perform a game but without using a die okay so you can you, you can do that but you can, you'll do that after rolling the dice because uh, you might not need to do it so um you might be able to do it without using the feet so if you roll the dice we'll, we'll look at focus afterwards cool so you've got so you're just rolling 2d10 and uh that's that's just the straight roll isn't it for your great lance uh does he yep. also get the d6 for um yeah i get it yeah i do want to i do want to declare i i do want to declare oh, de declare my ability Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. So you'll roll an extra d6 on all, all your attacks with the gout. You're all an extra d6. Cool. So, what have you got? Um, so I have 11 plus 14. Uh, don't add them together. We're just going to take that. Oh, we're going to look at each right. one individually. So, what's the highest die you've got? Well, now I don't remember because I <laughs> use <laughs> all the All right. right. So, I've got a five, a one and a six so five one and six so you can use any of those dice that are four or more you can sort of spend that die to attempt to gambit but he will get a save against it um, um otherwise the highest single die is the one that's going to do damage so at the moment as it stands you're doing six damage um but he's he's got his full armor on and a shield and a helm so he's sitting on like four armor okay um, um so i'm gonna the gambit would be so you could spend uh, the uh you said you had a five and a four is that right yeah uh, so you could spend the four six, to bolster six it and a five damage. sorry i have a six and a five. Oh yeah so you could spend the five to bolster the six up to seven damage or you could use it to try and um to try and dismount him or to try and um sort of pull his shield aside or to try and um impair his weapon for the next attack uh, let's go with Impair's weapon on the next attack. Okay, so you're spending the five to do that, and the six will be the one that's going to do damage. Um, so as it stands, well, I'll give him a save to avoid his shield, be his uh, attack being impaired next turn. So how exactly are you trying to impair his lance? Are you trying to sort of, I guess, like attack the lance arm, perhaps? Yeah, so I think, I think I'm rather than just aiming like, uh, I'm aiming for like his... I mean, I mean more for the shoulder than I am for the yeah. the body in order to kind of make his arm go kind of a little bit less okay, cool. the next attack. That's great. Um, so um, as you try and do that, um, you can hear, even though he's got the helm down, the bucket helm, um, you can hear him kind of grumbling and he's like, rah, 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 as he gets closer to you. Um, and um, y your lance is kind of both are about to strike each other. Um, he is going to um, use one of his dice. He's going to use a, a four to try and dismount you. Okay. 
Um, so he he has resisted your attempt to try and impair his um, lance arm. Okay. But he's used one of his. He's going to perform a gambit to try and dismount you. So he's trying to like knock you off your horse. Um, so he doesn't know that you've got this saddle. So normally you'd have to make a save to avoid being knocked off. Um, but he his attack is um, his attempt to dis dismount you fails. Um, so he has one attack die left, and it's a ten. So you can choose to um, you can deny that if you want, which is one of the other feats. But if you do that, you'll have to make a spirit save. Um, or else you'll be fatigued, which means you won't be able to use any more feats. Um, and it, so, and if I if I don't, then we're just going to look at it versus. You'll my... you'll take ten damage, so it'll be ten minus your armor of three, so that's seven points of damage, which will come off your guard first, and then off your vigor. Um. It's, so ten's quite bad, I would say. Yeah, ten is bad. <laughs> um, ten's basically yeah, let's, the yeah. let's let's deny let's deny. So you deny that. Um, so you kind of like perhaps you both kind of bashing each other's lances aside for for, for the first charge. Right. Um, but now you'll need to make a spirit save to see if you can avoid being fatigued. Okay. I rolled a seven. And your um, spirit is fourteen. Oh, so you're fine. So yeah, you've still got your fatigue. Uh, you're not you're not fatigued yet. Um, he did a smite. So oh, he he, however, the the older knight, uh, as he kind of comes past you, you although you knock each other's lances aside um he is fatigued from his attempt at smiting you um what was your damage die that you had left tony it was like a it was a six, six. yeah so the six um he you you managed to kind of like knock him a little bit off balance but you don't get like a solid blow in but you've definitely come off better on this first um this first tilt uh, so he's he's got nothing on you so far and you've managed to kind of knock him a little bit but not kind of hit his shoulder like you'd planned to and he is now visibly fatigued so you you sort of go down and you're turning around for the th for the second uh tilt uh so he won't be able to smite you he's just going to have to roll uh a regular attack okay. um are you just attacking as normal for now or did you want to smite um yeah let's go we'll smite this time that's fine so you can add a d12 now so you're rolling 2d10 and a d12 and a d6 <laughs> Uh, one, five, eight, eleven. You'll be pleased to know he's rolled a one on his only attack die, so that will just be eaten up by your armor. So yeah. you don't need to worry about him. Um, you can do whatever you you want, basically. So you said eleven is your highest die. Uh, yeah. Um, kill him. <laughs> and you can use any dice that are four or more. You can spend them to bolster it up by a point each. So I don't know. I don't know what number you can get to with that. I mean, I could get to. 13 at that point in time, but that doesn't seem much better than 11, I'll be honest. Um, isn't it, it's isn't it also that if you have a gambit dice which is eight or higher, then they can't even save. Yes, yeah, so you can yeah. spend an eight so, or higher to just like, like, if you want to dismount him, you can just spend an eight and he'll be. Yeah, that's the thing. I think we're just going to spend the eight to dismount him uh, on this. On this so you're going to dismount him, and you'll still do the damage of the eleven. And, yeah, and you did you have any other dice for four or more? I mean, I guess I guess I can bolster for yeah one, so we'll go up to twelve. Yeah, so we're going to do twelve da twelve damage, and we're going to dismount him with no save because it was a strong gambit. Um, okay, let's see what that does. Um, well, he's thrown from his horse, um, and the twelve damage is going to get reduced to eight. But oof. Okay. So Hell that yeah. is, in, in game terms, it's a wound, but because you're using blunted ones, you kind of like, you hit him really hard with this land. You get it right in the center of his mass and you send him tumbling from his horse, uh, Steve, down to the ground. And let's see if the landing is going to finish him off. He, the landing is not too bad. He kind of lands flat on his back um, and kind of gets to his feet just about. And he is clearly like... What is really what are the onlooker's response to this? Um, but he kind of uh, pulls the hammer off his back and he uh, sort of shouts at you, on foot for the last one. I thought we were doing three tilts. Um, he sort of like, he sort of beckons at you with the hammer and he's, he's ready for you to, you can just charge him on your steed if you want to. <laughs> Do it. Fuck him up. Um, <laughs> Smite him. What? Fictional position wise, how wide is this bridge we're on? Um, it's it's it, it looks bad from down there, but you've you're not going to like necessarily you, you could try and like drive him off the edge of the bridge if you really wanted to. 
Um, that that's probably considered slightly poor form for. I mean, I feel like we're in poor form mode <laughs> now. Um, Tony, just roll really um, well and repel like five times. <laughs> actually, you know what? So I can still use the Great Lands on foot. I'm just slow when doing it, correct? Yeah, so it means you can't use it after moving. So it would be kind of awkward here. You probably wouldn't be able to like charge up to him and use it. You do have a it's assumed you have a dagger as well, or like a a, a very short short sword, which which does D6 damage. So short of anything else. Um, that will be an option. Oh, you've got your javelins. You, your javelins basically work. Like yeah, I do. But I think I'm just going to get on. I think I'll get nearish to him, get on yeah. foot, and then just motion him to charge in, like as if I'm complying, but but make him come towards me a little bit. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So you're in position. Yeah. And you're going to let him come to you. Yeah. Okay. That's great. So he's going to take a swing at you. Because otherwise, he's just going to be like, oh, you didn't get on foot for the last one. You lose. And I'm not, I don't want to deal with that. And so. <laughs> So he's going to swing his hammer at you, um, and he's got his shield, uh, and you are going to attack. Did, with I your... to, did I need a Vig save on since I used smite? Oh yeah, could you could you smite it? Yeah, so Vigor save. Um, I am fatigued on Vigor. I can't smite anymore. You you passed. Sorry, was that? No, I did not pass. I rolled. A ah, so you are fatigued. So no more feats for you this turn. Um, I so, should not have brought that up. Dumb me. Um. <laughs> Cool. Yeah. Okay. So, just... so he's rolling. You're rolling. Uh, eight nine six. Um. So what's what's your um, what's your plan for that? Well, let's see what he's going to try and do. He's just going to try and swing for you with it for as much as possible. He's got a two, a five, and a six. You can't you can't deny any of them because you're um you're fatigued. Right. So you're looking at taking seven damage. Uh, you got three armor, so that's actually four damage. That's I'm that's not great. That's my guard. So like that's that's. Is it exactly your guard? That's exactly my guard. So he will cause a scar to you, uh, which okay. we'll deal with when it happens. Sure. Um, and your what's your damage? Uh, nine was my highest. Yeah, that'll do it. So you um you would effectively, if this were mortal combat, you would be you would deal him a mortal wound, which would be deadly. But you 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 have enough to sort of deal a decisive blow that will take him out of the fight. Um, so. I'll ask you how that looks in a minute, but um, in terms of your scar, before you can get in, deal that decisive blow, you take... Oh, well, rather appropriately, um, he um, his huge hammer kind of comes at you and you, you sort of duck the first one perhaps, but then on the backswing, catches you across the head and it sort of sends your helm tumbling to the ground, uh, dented. Um, so you are concussed, which means you're fancy helmet. four <laughs> points of parity. Okay. But then you can um, you can take him out basically. So uh, what's what's the plan? I mean, I can't use gambits, right? Or I can't use feats. Which one? Because I'm fatigued. No, you, you've essentially kind of dealt enough damage to win the combat. No, no, I know. I just I'm trying to. I I think I would love to get this guy like on the edge. Uh, so I think we yeah. yeah I that's think I just knock him over. We see kind of his, uh, maybe even his shield scatter and kind of skitch over the edge uh, as he gets knocked to the ground um, hard. And I, as I bring, as I, as I just, just do a wide, like, you know, he, he swings once, hits my head. I step through and I just swing the lance around and knock him kind of sprawling and flying. Uh, yeah. Forward. So perhaps you kind of knock him to the edge, um, but then you're kind of standing over him as he's on the edge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I guess in that situation, let, let me let me check how he's feeling. I think in that situation, he has no choice but to, he sort of throws his helm down and kind of like drops his hammer and says, I yield to you, young knight. Of course. Um, <laughs> I'll reach out a hand and, and pick him up. So you kind of help him up um, and he kind of... Um, begrudgingly kind of like goes and collects up his his stuff hands his hands his rips off his plate armor and throws it to the ground and for his squire to pick up um and yeah he kind of seems like he he, he doesn't actually say that you won necessarily in terms of the judgment angle but ev it's clear to everyone that you've won 
Um, so he kind of uh, goes away and starts talking to um, people and you can make out that he's he's making arrangements for your boat to be uh, laden and um, to set off uh, first thing tomorrow morning for um, for Lothal Bridge, uh, where, the, where you would find the Ghoul Knights. Right. So, um, so yeah, you can, presumably, um, you can recover your guard if you've lost any. You can recover your uh, vigor because you're going to have a Knight of Hospitality in the Hall of the Dusk Knights. But, um, for, yeah, your clarity is a bit dented now from that concussion, so you would need to seek the guidance of a seer for that. Um, if that opportunity arises. Um, but yeah, was there any business before tomorrow morning that you wanted to take care of in this uh, in this place before we go? Um, I'm just going to, just in my history of shit talking here, I'll uh, go find those same people and gossip about how, how bad he had his ass kicked here. <laughs> I mean, you, you go to start those rumors, but it's already like that's the story that's going around. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. I just wanted to cement it for in the future when he claims he's undefeated because he didn't make a judgment call at the end. That's it. Um, so yeah, it, ev everyone knows it was plain to see who, who the winner was in that joust. Um, and yeah, you 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 enjoy some more hospitality, but uh, sort of preparing yourselves for uh, the voyage ahead uh, to, out to the west to um to, to where the Ghoul Knight is. Um, so in the morning you head out and there is a, um, a, sh a ship is ready, like kind of a long ship style, uh, ship. Um, the, the mast is already raised and the, the sails are out and it's kind of ready to go. Um, and there's a, there's a, a small crew on there waiting for you. The horse box is waiting for the horses. <laughs> um, and, um, and yeah, did, are you happy to sort of set sail, uh, to the West? Yeah. Yeah, let's go. Cool. Cool. Um, so, um, and on the first morning, let's do the all important uh, weather check. I mean, I don't care because he, he looks delightful, but is Colin frozen for anybody else? Yep. Now that yeah. you mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> Bear with me a moment here. You're not uh, going to believe me, but there's 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 like several, there's lots of different weather results, and I've rolled fog like every single time on this weather table so it is another foggy day out on the sea um and by the end of the first by the end of the first morning um you're kind of following the coast along and you're passing by like kind of um the the continent is to the south as you're kind of out to sea and um you're passing by this kind of like dry harsh kind of mediterranean -y, quite barren landscape um and by the middle of the day, you sort of you put down a little channel between the mainland and another island, and you can just about make out on the horizon. Um, there is another kind of like there's another holding to your south, um, and one of the crew kind of gestures to it and tells you that that is a Torengard, and it's got these very tall turrets, and um, that is the um, that is the holding of the Mule Knight. Um, so that's not where you're going, but just for future reference, um, down there is where that is. Um, and that does rhyme. Maybe there's something in that. The mule might need the gold. Yeah, I hadn't. Uh... Mm. Um, and yeah, a very French like... of you there, Chris. <laughs> there's only so many syllables I can use. Um, so yeah, the, um, the as, as the sun starts to sort of set. Um, you're you know there's a little cabin in the the ship and you're able to kind of sleep through the first night um and then the second day of travel goes much the same um the landscape becomes much um whereas it was already kind of barren and harsh the land that you're sailing into now is um it almost looks like salt salted kind of crystalline like peaks um on the horizon and then kind of like a sort of salt flat sort of territory almost um leading out into the into the distance and um the ship pulls up on the shore um and sort of like expecting it kind of gestures to this this barren salt flat in front of you and says right here we are this is um this is where my lord told me to to drop you
great. Um, Thanks. I assume we don't see the his the hold we're looking for, like just in the distance. Um, there's no sign of any kind of holding. Um, the crew assure you that um, if you um, if you head to the west through the salt flats, it's just um, it, it might you might have to set up camp for the night in the in the flats, but it's just beyond the point. But um, but this ship can't get really any closer than that. Well, I guess we head west, uh, assuming the Dust Knight was honorable here. Didn't just send us to a desert to die. Are you all happy yeah, to no, uh, yeah. disembark? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Um, so, sure enough, uh, you, you hop out onto this... Um, this dry flat landscape um there are some sort of peaks off to the north um but it's otherwise it's just kind of flats as far as you can see uh, but you've been directed to keep going west they've told you that um that's kind of the way to go um as you sort of travel there um you reach a point where it's the sun is just starting to go down and you can just about make out on the horizon there is a silhouette of something on the horizon and it is um you can just about make out a tower on the horizon um it's too far away for you to get there before sunset so you are probably gonna have to set up a uh set up a camp for the night unless you want to travel through the night um which is um, not necessarily advisable, um, but it's an option. Um, however, also to your south, you do notice something else as well. Bear with me. Um, so the um, it's it's kind of like this. Like I said, this kind of there's not much to describe because it is really just like a flat sort of salt waste plain. There's been a kind of a little bit of a, a wind blowing over breeze will occasionally rise into a bit of a howling breeze. Um, however, it does stir up a bit of dust. To the south, it looks incredibly still and incredibly silent to the south. Um, and you can you can make out there are some kind of like, there's some kind of like standing stone perhaps to the south in the distance, like a kind of not too tall obelisk. Um, but yeah, you've got that as well. So um I'm assuming you're going to want to set up camp for the night. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So again, you've I guess you've refilled your rations at um at Ebramir and salt got, fish all the way down. Not much living off the land here. Um ooh, but let's see. Bear with me. Um, as you, um, as you're setting up camp for the night and as you're sleeping, um, you're awoken by a thrashing noise outside and the horses are like clearly alarmed and like the horses are neighing, panicking and, um, sort of stomping around. Um, is someone going to go out and check it out? Just let the horse whisperer do that. Yeah, I will definitely. Um, I'll be up and uh, and and pull on my pantalons and and head on out. So heading out to the um, to the camp, um, you see, like I said, the horses are panicking, and there's a bright. You, you obviously um, uh, that the fire was under control when you when you left it, um, but there are now like patches of fire all around, sort of burning almost on the on the ground itself, just like nothing is like but just burning nothing. Um, and you can, amongst the kind of flickering light, you can see a thrashing sort of tail-like thing just kind of like swinging and like it perhaps knocks one of the um, the shelters that you made um, down. And that it's like a sort of, it looks very much like the tail of that lizard creature that you saw at the start. And from the kind of the raw stump end of the tail, um, it's just dripping this kind of flaming blood and scattering fire all around the camp. Uh, what do you do? Uh, I will. Uh, I will first shout at the men uh, for everybody else. It's like everyone up, 
Bring water. So everyone else is probably kind of roused already, uh, at least a little bit. But yeah, you kind of shout them to all come out and you all come out and you see this thrashing giant tail spreading fire around the camp. Oh, we should do something about that. Um, I think the only thing to really do about that might be leave, because I don't imagine we have enough water on us to, you know, put out a fire. You have like, yeah, you have like your drinking water, but um, but yeah, it, it would be, this isn't a great place to run out of water. Normally you would rely on streams and stuff to, yeah. to drink from, but this isn't a particularly hospitable yeah. environment. So you could just travel on through the night, uh, but that does come with its own risks. Let's travel on through the night. It's a one shot. <laughs> so it's it's a one shot. And yeah, I mean, they get to use that rule. The yeah, night yeah. Doesn't, doesn't have a giant flaming tail entirely. Maybe not okay, so you you're gonna are you heading towards the the tower of what looked like the um what looked like the holding? Yep. Yeah, I think so. Uh, well, the keyword is you're going to try to do that because it's pitch black and you've got like you can light some torches or something, but it's still very difficult to get your bearings uh, at night, even with the stars, because the stars aren't always to be trusted. Um, so, amazingly, you ride through the night, um, but um, you, you sort of you start to doubt yourselves. You start to worry that you're heading out into the endless salt wastes. You start to worry that this was the plan all along for the dust night to send you out here. But eventually you start to see on the horizon the flickering lights of the the outside of the um of the holding that you're trying to head for. Um and yeah, you you don't get lost in the night, which is good. However, traveling through the night and not getting sleep and uh having your senses constantly be tricked uh, means you're each gonna lose D6 spirit and you're each gonna lose D6 clarity. Whoa. Uh -oh. Uh, don't worry if it goes to zero. It's not good, but you're not you're not going to die if it goes to zero. What if it goes into the negatives? Uh, no, just zero. You can't go below zero. Okay, cool, cool. You know what's sad, Keegan? With everything that's happened in my clarity and spirit right now, um, I still have 12 in each one. Hey, do you want to guess how much <laughs> I have in both of them? I mean, negative in one of them. Uh, I, it would have been negative two in spirit um, and zero in clarity. So uh, here's the here's the deal. If you are reduced to zero in um, in each virtue, it has different effects. So if you're reduced to zero vigor, not through damage, because if you're reduced to zero vigor through damage, you're slain. But if your vigor is just like drained to zero, you're exhausted, which means you can't move and attack on the same turn, basically. If you're reduced to clarity zero, you're exposed, which means you essentially have zero guard. So you're very vulnerable to attack. If you're used to spirit zero, your attacks are impaired, which means they all your attacks just do D4 damage. Mm. So it is very bad to run out of uh, a virtue. Um, so it's best to not let that happen. Um, but sure enough, riding through the night, um, as the sun is starting to come up, you make it to um, Larfell Bridge, um, which is, like I say, this kind of like, as you get closer to this tower on the that sort of stands out on this on the skyline of this holding um behind the walls um you see it's actually kind of like it was perhaps once a much larger tower it kind of looks almost like it's just sort of crumbled halfway down it's got this crooked top and it's this kind of square tower at the center of this um this holding and um yeah the, the gates are closed because it's like it's still kind of dark when you arrive um but with a bit of like banging on the gates um a guard just sort of come and open them um, and inside, um, you can see, yeah, there is there is the kind of the ruined tower um, at the center of this um, of this holding. And the, the the thing that stands out in here is that outside the holding there is this large kind of sunken into the ground, this kind of like amphitheater, um, uh, where already there are um, there are sort of soldiers training and fighting each other and sparring in this kind of arena. Um, at the base of, of this uh, holding, um, and yeah, the, um, the the holding itself looks out over this huge kind of lagoon to the south um, that sort of stretches out as far as you can see. Um, and in the distance to the north, you can just about make out the sea is a uh, is a bit further to the north. Um, but yeah, it's first thing in the morning in Laughel Bridge, um, supposedly the home of the Ghoul Knight. Did you want to go looking for him? Absolutely. And we yes. go ask some of the soldiers if they've seen the ghoul knight or not. 
um you ask around and you know w- w- without seeing too fussed they kind of like gesture towards uh the large tower and say oh yes the uh the, the lord is in the tower are you are you heading on in it might be worth sending sending a message uh so that the ghoul knight is informed of us rather than rousing him i think that might be the uh that might be a bit rude for us um so you can probably assume that like someone probably ran ahead when they saw four knights arrive it's kind of the protocol so you're you you've probably been told that you've arrived um and again the kind of the culture of hospitality is that you would be expected to go and uh and uh go and meet with him upon arriving um so heading into the the tower itself um it's like I say, it's kind of there's like a slightly solemn atmosphere to this whole place. Even though there's this fighting going on, they're kind of all very quiet, and uh, the people you talk to aren't particularly chatty. They're all kind of like um, very much like they'll answer the question but no more, and then they want to get on with what they're doing. Um, and inside the um, inside the tower, um, the centerpiece of this hall is this huge kind of this huge cauldron, sort of about as tall as a person. Um, this huge sort of black cauldron. And it's um, it's there's like a fire burning underneath it, but you can't see inside it. There's just this cauldron burning, and um, and sort of all the way down the walls, uh, there are long sort of tapestries down each side, um, and the tapestries kind of show scenes of um, they show scenes of um, of it's lots of death scenes if you like. So it's a it's a knight kind of being run through by a spear. And then the next scene is like a knight being crushed under a cavalry charge and then a knight sort of an arrow going through his neck. Um, and it looks like it's all the same knight. Hmm. Um, and yeah, the, the ghoul knight uh, isn't here yet. Um, but after a moment of sort of looking around the tapestries, um, you see this kind of hunched figure um, kind of come out. Uh, he has this sort of bearded axe that he's kind of leaning on like a crutch almost um and he has this sort of long male coat uh, which sort of looks dusty almost like it's like it's like he's taking it straight off the wall uh, of a display and he's kind of like coming over to you and you know the, the dust knight was kind of a normal older man uh this man looks ancient like his skin is like i uh, sort of hanging off his face almost and like drawn back and you almost like you can see his skeleton and incredibly sort of pale yellow skin and you would probably be pretty safe to assume that this is the dust knight uh, the, the ghoul knight i should say um and he sort of comes over um to you and he is accompanied by um by the, the sort of a few like guards armored guards kind of around him um but like standing back from it he kind of approaches you and he says, "You you were sent here uh, by by the seers. You you were the ones that they said was going to come." Um, and he kind of like trails off for a second and pauses, and then says, um, so "Why why are you here?" Like like you just said, we we were sent here by the seers. The seers, uh, yes. Um, well, so, so tell, tell me, you, you must, you must, you must be tired from the. Uh, did you come over the? Did you travel through the flats, or did you come into the dock? Uh, we entered through the dust knights' lands. Ah, the, the wastes. Um, it's a an interesting route. I, I would have recommended coming into the uh, our our port to the north. Um, so tell me, did you um? And then he sort of like, you see him kind of like hunch forward and then start to cough violently. And the the, the, the soldiers don't seem that bothered that around. They're kind of like, like they feel like they see this every day. And he falls to the ground. And again, the soldiers don't seem that bothered. And he's lying motionless on the ground. So Knife will certainly walk up towards him and offer a hand to help, um, help I just would go to help. One, of, one of the soldiers kind of steps forward and she says um don't don't worry uh always oh, is, is this your first time visiting um it is good night 
um, she kind of gestures to the, the tapestries and she says, we see this every day, don't worry. Um, and they kind of wait expectantly um, for a moment. And then one of the soldiers kind of reaches down and kind of checks the, um, checks the, checks the, the breathing and pulse and says, no, it's, it, it, it's no good. And the soldiers kind of, two of the soldiers heft up his body and they walk over to the huge cauldron in the center of the, um, the hall. And they just heft the body over into the cauldron. And um, from sort of behind the soldiers, um, a, a sort of younger um, knight comes out. Um, and she says, she, she's sort of like, um, she's wearing like a, she's, she's wearing her plate, like almost like she's dressed for battle. Um, and, she, but she has, and she has a helm under her um, arm and she has a, a long sword at the other side. Uh, she comes over and says, um, I, "I'm afraid that um, my my father will not be able to um, not be able to speak with you today. Um, he's going through his his process. Um, of course, you're very welcome to stay, and um, we will um, we, we, we will put you up. But uh, I'm, I'm sure tomorrow he will be in better health. Um, from where we are, can we see into the cauldron now? I know we just." watched him get um no it's well it's, it's kind of like it's it's a bit too tall to see in you can see there's a fire underneath it and uh as as he was thrown into it um you didn't hear like any noise like he's moving within there or anything you just heard the kind of the thump of him landing inside the cauldron i mean i get it whatever whatever works to to help you win like you got to do it so it's fine why are you cooking this old man it's the um i'm afraid it's his it is gift and his curse uh i'm afraid um i think he'll although he looks like an old man and i I'm, I'm certain he'll outlive all of us um but yes um i think perhaps we'll, we'll we can save these questions for for tomorrow uh he he'll be in a much better position to to speak with you tomorrow um until then um I'm, I'm sure we, we can put you up and we can we can help with any needs that you have. I don't suppose you have a uh, any seers nearby. We um we appear to have been expected, and of course we we ourselves were sent across to meet with your father, not knowing why, but for the words of the seers. Uh, Perhaps oh, we might see. If counsel. you want to speak with yeah the, the seer um the, the seer who looks over us here is the armored seer um and um they they are to the to the south if you head for the standing stone um and follow the stairway down yeah that makes sense i think we should um so i'm guessing you'll ride out in the afternoon to meet with the um the armored seer to try and find them so seers tend to live out in a in what's called a sanctum uh which is kind of a place they can exist just outside of society really um for reasons that will become clear um and yeah they um as you kind of ride closer to the standing stone it's kind of afternoon by the time you get there um it's a um it's it's kind of a single almost triangular standing stone with like some smaller stones dotted around it in kind of like white white sort of crystalline stone and sure enough there is a um that's kind of like a dusty stairway leading down below the stone, almost like a tomb. Um, and you can hear kind of metallic, like grinding noises coming from underneath. Um, are you going to head down into the, into the darkness? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. My horse yep, has dark definitely. vision. <laughs> your, your horse can perhaps if your horse looks <laughs> down into the darkness your horse seems reluctant to go into the darkness okay well i'll leave it here and go without the dark vision so you leave your steeds out here um and as you kind of like head down into the um into the darkness you can see there are like some dull torch lights there's some dull torch light coming from from underneath um and you kind of you're looking around in this kind of like like this, this this huge kind of chamber underneath at the ground and then once the flickering light you can make out some kind of like metal structure in the center of the room or some kind of metal um 
like it looks almost like a heap of just metal plates um and then as you get closer you hear the whirring of chains and the metal plates start to form together and with a loud sort of clanking and grinding they sort of snap together um into a a huge kind of humanoid figure kind of twice as twice as broad as you would expect a person to be um and you can't make out what's beneath the armor but you can see there's like a humanoid moving within the metal um and it kind of like with a clunk steps forwards with one foot and then clunk steps forward to the other and um sort of from within the armor you hear the voice um saying what truth do you seek knights uh, we seek the truth of why we were sent here. You were sent here to find the ghoul knight. Did you find him? Yes. Then let me show you what you must do. And a chain sort of like sort of slinks out from the um, from the the, I guess what's the closest to the arm of this huge trunk of armor and this sort of writhes up towards you like a snake and starts to wrap itself around your leg um, are you cool with this? yeah um, this chain sort of wraps itself around you and you start to get flashes of like imagery and um, you see within these flashes um you actually see um, the bloody knight. You see um, Colin's character. Um, you see him looking, holding his hands out, covered in blood. So, you know, a normal day in the office. Mm -hmm. But standing beneath him, standing below him, sorry, um, you see the figure, or rather the, the, the corpse of the ghoul knight at his feet. Um, and he's not moving and he has been violently murdered by the bloody knight um and then you suddenly snap back to reality and um this armored seer says this is what must be done to protect the realm but i had you... planned oh sorry oh i was gonna just ask would he not just come back no Good enough for me. Did uh, do, did all of us see the vision, or was it um, was it uh, just 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 the fox knight? Oh, I'll explain what I just saw to the group in that case. Sure. Um, any further questions for the seer? Um, for the GM, how do we get spirit or clarity back when we're at a seer? Uh, you would well, receive guidance from a seer, so I think this 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 whole process, this meeting with the seer, guidance. this vague guidance would count. It's basically like have counsel with the seer, really. Cool. Um, so you will walk out of here with full clarity. Yay! Weirdly, despite the lack of clarity in the instructions, well, it's quite clear instructions, I guess. I mean, the instructions are just murder this man, and yeah, I I don't have any. And and what's more, his his guards seem to be perfectly happy with the fact that he just constantly dies. <laughs> So it shouldn't even be that difficult for us to say, well, we spoke with the seer, and he says that we should give him another death. We, we could even add more details. Like, it must be done at noon at the dinner table to make it sound more, like, mystic or something. Um, I'm very into this plan. <laughs> to, be, to be honest, I had planned on doing that anyway. <laughs> at noon <laughs> on the dinner table? <laughs> well, it... um, at the risk of... Um... At the risk of an unsatisfying ending, I think we're are we are we reaching the limit of our time? I mean, we yeah. I mean, like I, I, I mean that doesn't feel like an unsatisfying ending. We did the we did the thing you told us to do at the beginning of the session, and so this does feel like a good place to stop if we want to. 
Yeah. Yeah, because I've, I've gone for the I've gone for the authentic sandbox uh, thing here, where I haven't planned anything in terms of. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you don't uh, have a grand narrative arc. I can't imagine. Yeah. Um, then let's just do our reaction roll. Reaction roll is a live stream inside of a live stream. It's our chance to sit down with the creator of a game that we just played and talk about what it was like to play that game. Uh, today we're talking about Mythic Bastion Land with Chris McDowell. Uh, Chris, great to have you on. Really great to have you run for us. And yeah, I. I loved the amount of rolling and sandboxiness of this session. It's very rare that we get to sit down and just mess around in a world for a little bit. Uh, and so it was really great to do this one. Uh, for people who are just joining us or just catching this part of the stream, uh, why don't you tell us a little about who you are, uh, what you do, and tell us a little bit more about Mythic Bastion Land. Uh, so um, my name is Chris McDowell. Um, I design games at Bastion Land Press, uh, such as Into the Odd and Electric Bastion Land. And yeah, we've just played Mythic Bastion Land. Uh, which is kind of the whereas my previous games have been kind of more focused on the dungeon and the city I wanted to make a game that was focused on the wilderness and to do so I kind of looked into the mythic past of this world so a sort of imagined past of kind of knights and myths and weird wilderness um, that kind of exists in the past of the, the setting of the other games um, but also in, in myth rather than in history um, and yeah, I, I wanted to get that focus on like exploration and travel and kind of, yeah, like, like you say, that kind of sandbox hex crawling style of gameplay um, is something I've always really enjoyed. And um, so, yeah, hopefully that's what we've got a little bit of a taste of. Awesome. Uh, I had a great time playing, but let's hear from some of our other uh, players. Keegan, let's start with you. Why don't you tell people who you are, what you do, and what it was like to play the game? Yeah, hi, I'm Keegan EXE. I'm a game designer, and I stream here on Plus One. Um, this was a blast. I had a great time. Um, I think normally Tony says, and uh, any questions you might have. And I just, I have to know more about the, the Seers, because they're very my shit. <laughs> So yeah, the, the seers, um, as they're kind of described in the world, is they're essentially like incredibly, they're, they're simultaneously like great sources of information because they kind of know everything about what happened, what has happened and what's going to happen. But they're always like restricted in some kind of weird way. And for each of the, there's 72 seers in the book. And for each of them, that there's a very specific vibe that I wanted to get from each one, which is if you remember in, in the the old Dune film, like the 80s Dune film, the scene with the navigator, um, mm. the guild, uh, navigator guild. What's I can't remember the name of the guy, um, but where they where they roll in the giant tank yeah. and the state, the, the, reacting the, to that, the and they open up yeah. the tank, and from within the mist emerges this huge weird thing, and this is the important guy. Um, that kind of vibe is what I wanted to go for. So there, some of them are very. The, the armor series is one of the, the weirder ones. Um, some of them are more human. But yeah, they're essentially like weird takes on the idea of Merlin, I guess. Like 72 weird, horrible Merlins. Damn, that's a whole book on its own right there. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta love a weird, uh, weird Merlin. Love it. Um, let's drop down to, or let's jump over to Colin. Colin, I want you to people who you are, what you do, and what it was like uh, to play Mythic Bastion Land. Yeah, um, Colin, I uh, design games uh, as Bio and Spirit RPG. You can be found by RPG.com or at by um, So some games I've designed have been inspired uh, by uh, Into the Odd and Cairn, like Rune Cairn and We Deal in Lead. So what I found really interesting is the changes that you've made to the core Into the Odd system, especially around combat, because that's what uh, that's a lot of what I did when when I was hacking uh, the the original system. So how did how did you find it um, taking what was a really streamlined system and pared down, and like how did you find navigating, adding stuff to it, or, or like like how how was that experience for you? Well, first of all, it's going to sound like I'm saying this as some kind of like um, uh, for just being polite, but I, this is true. I have used Rune Can so much as an inspiration for like some of the stuff that I've done here. <laughs> And when I read Runeken, it was a big influence on what I wanted to do with uh, Mythic Bastion. And um, so the, the specifics ended up being quite different, but um, but it was it was a huge inspiration. I really love what you did with Runeken. Um, okay. In terms of, it, it was tricky because what I didn't want to do is I didn't want to just make Into the Odd again, but give it like a medieval coat of paint. So I mm -hmm. thought, well, for this one, I've, I've always wanted to make combat very simple before, like you said, and make it very much about problem solving. But in this one, I 
I thought the setting justified having a little bit more meat to deal with in combat because the characters are all innately kind of martial characters. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Inter Yard and Electric Bastion Land, you might just be some loser who's lost their job and you've become a treasure hunter. Uh, whereas here, everybody should be able to like make some interesting combat decisions that are a bit more martial. So I wanted to have that feel in there with the knight. So yeah, the things like the feats and the gambits, um, mm -hmm. they definitely change how it plays. And they do add that little step of complexity, which is very scary to me because I thought I, I really didn't want to like undo all the hard work I've done with making a very simple streamlined system by just slapping a load of stuff on top of it. But I hope that they all, they work kind of in balance with it and they they don't, um, it still keeps things moving fast. Combat is still fast and decisive mm -hmm. is the thing that I wanted, uh, even though it is more involved. So yeah, it, it was it was a real balancing act to try and get that right. Cool. Yeah, I think it it's really uh, like it plays differently than into the odd, but that's that's cool. Like it's a good like the the pieces work well together, like the three different virtues uh, mixed with the the feats and how you like how you need to do different saves depending on what kind of feat you're doing. I think yeah. that works really well. Um, and the gambits, I think those are like it's a really cool list to to pull from. Just kind of like things that you might want to try in combat. Yeah, it's, yeah, I enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. And I think with the gambits, the key is um, for a while I had a similar system in place where players could like almost accidentally end up with a position where it's like, oh, now you can perform a gambit for free. But mm -hmm. the problem there is like sometimes sometimes you don't want to do a disarm or a push. Sometimes you just want to do more damage. So the thing that makes it work for me is having that bolster result in there where even if you don't want to do something fancy, you can just spend your extra dice to boost the damage up. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I feel like that helps keep it kind of be a bit more accessible. If you've got a player who's just a bit more like, I don't want to get too bogged down in the specifics. I just want to do damage. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to have that option. Awesome. Sean, how about you? All the things plus any questions you got? So, yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Sean F. Smith. That's he and him. Uh, and you can often find me uh, on the internet using that name, um, which luckily, because I decided that... Uh, that I had to talk with my initial in the middle there. It's relatively easy to search for. Um, I am a writer, games designer, plus mage, uh, all manner of things. And what I found really interesting about this today, I said earlier on as part of the mainstream, uh, my academic specialty is medieval English. Uh, there was a point where I used to run potentially the oldest fantasy setting I'm aware of, which is a 14th century manuscript called Sir Orfeo that Chaucer owned a copy of. And so I would run that as a fantasy setting which is quite fun um it certainly feels that there's maybe like mythic britainness and uh, arthuriana in the uh, in the waters at the moment what with uh, pendragon having a sixth edition coming out this year uh, but my question for chris is uh is much more so about some of the other stuff that we didn't come through today um for those who aren't aren't quite such um say historians probably the best sense in this sense um historians of of your current works uh this year you've also released the doomed um through osprey i believe uh which is obviously i mean you, presumably you'll be better placed to, to talk about it than i am um but as a like skirmish war game and with mythic bastion land being very much more from the perspective of martial characters um how much were you conscious to try and keep those streams separate and how much were you allowing yourself to like cross pollinate between them um it's interesting because i actually wrote the doomed quite a long time ago the doomed was like my lockdown project in the sense that um one of the few things that so so i i'd, I'd been away from miniatures for years and years and years i've been uh i've been on the wagon and then when lockdown happened i um i thought one of the things i could do in lockdown was uh paint some miniatures again and relive my teenage years of badly painting miniatures and um, that all kind of grew out of that. So that that was kind of done before I started on this. They were kind of coming from two different places. Um, but it's interesting because even though this has an element of, like I say, the combat is a little bit more involved, I still would probably never run this with like miniatures and like a grid or anything. I would still probably just keep it as like theater of the mind uh, description because for me, it, I mean, I, like, like the combat we had, we had uh, the combat with the lizard, for instance um that was a monster that you couldn't just fight so it ended up being a little bit of a problem solving thing about getting underneath it and for me that's where rpg combat shines whereas 
miniature combat is much more about the specific spatial element of like can my guy see your guy and like um and things like that so i think i think for me they scratch both quite different itches so weirdly i've never really thought about them cross pollinating that they're quite distinct in my head really um i i had a blast um i really enjoyed playing i thought it's one of the things where i very often will intentionally not spend a ton of time with a game before we stream especially if i played other things by that creator um so that we can take it in pretty fresh and so even though i had had done a glance at the quick start you know when you had first dropped it and sent it out um, I didn't, I, I intentionally was like, I want to, I want to experience this and play a little bit more. So I actually thought the gambits and the feats really just brought a ton to it. Um, especially for the vibe. I think everything you were trying to do with that, it, it achieves really well. And I think even like one of the things with the rules light system that we'll commonly hear people complain about is like, oh, I didn't know what to do because you can do anything. And so therefore it is, it is a lot harder to know exactly what you should. The hand the handholds that the feats, uh, the the feats and the gambits give to you, really help ground. I think a player in the okay, here are things I can do immediately, and depending on kind of what I'm good at, might depend on what I want to lean into. But also situationally, and what's happening in combat is also going to bring up some of those same different pieces. And so suggesting that, and then even you know the classic last one of. Um, or other things similar to this scale or effect as far as the gambits go is a really just good thing like yeah gambits can cover a lot of things so if you have an idea that you want to be a gambit you know pitch it out um and it was really interesting to be able to see it in play even though i was creating another character at the same time um it, as a group and then being able to do it one-on-one -on -one even had a little bit of a very different feel to it that felt really uniquely suited to those two types of combat um, I mean, there may have been a little bit of ruling there, but like it just it was it was still super enjoyable to see that and to be making those kind of moment to moment tactical choices that you don't get in rules like games. But everything still fits on a very simple character sheet, right? It's still very easy to take in, and the gambits almost don't feel like mechanics so much as just presentational context to affect the narrative, which is exactly what I want from most of my. When, when I get into crunchy bits, I'm like, D I don't want it to just be numbers. I want you to tell me what it's doing in the narrative. And so, yeah, um, just kudos on that. I think for me, the question goes a little further afield. And if you've talked about this other places, I apologize. But um, I love that you're creating in a world, and especially since you're creating in a world that you're establishing a history with, but that world has been taken in so many different anti-canonical directions, right? How do you interpret? Internally, do you have a mental map of some kind of history for Bastion Land? Like, and and if so, could you let us into some of the major beats as you think about them? So the the way I've decided to do this is I've I, 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 I had an initial idea for how this would all fit together with Electric Bastion Land and Into the Odd, but it's such I'm trying to think of a way to say it without a uh, it's 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 such a self-congratulatory indulgent thing to do we that love I, that on and, stream Get no, no, yeah, no, I'm, I'm on board with it but i mean I, I don't want to lead with that so i've so the book itself is kind of self-contained if you just picked up mythic bastion and you didn't know what into the odd was or electric bastion you kind of you don't need to know those even exist like it, it works on its own but if you really want to get into the deep lore between the two um the way that it's not so much that there's um like a timeline because one of the notes I have at the top of my document when I was writing this is myth, not history. Because I kept slipping into thinking like, well, what would what would an authentic early medieval solution to this thing I'm thinking of be? And I need to keep shaking myself out of it because I want it to feel grounded a little bit in some sort of reality. But it is essentially, this setting is the creation myth for the setting of Electric Bastion Land. Right. So it's almost like this setting could have been written by someone in Electric Bastion Land. Um, so if the electric bastion and if 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 somewhere in into the odd there is the version of um an author who is writing you know the history of the the history of the kings and queens of bastion land um it sort of becomes myth but the way that deep country works in electric bastion land, which is the area outside of bastion i'm sorry this is turning into such an indulgent thing but i'm, I'm halfway through now so i'm going to carry on well, uh, it's what um, i want to know so keep on going <laughs> But there's there's a line in Electric Bastion Land that going into Deep Country is like going back in time, like when you go 
um, when you go to a really rural area and it feels a bit like you've gone back 10 years in time. So taking that to the extreme, there is an idea that if you travel into a certain direction, you could end up in the mythic past of this world. So there is going to be some notes in the book about how to sort of travel between the two settings. Um, and so, yeah, they do kind of both exist in the same space. Um, but it's very much a case that this is like a sort of weird alternate history you can go to rather than this is the canonical um, past. And in and in this book, there's lots of references to the city. The city is kind of like the holy grail of this myth. So it's like the unattainable thing that all knights would eventually hope to go on the city quest. And obviously the, the implication is that the city is Bastion. So it could be that when you complete the city quest, you arrive in Bastion of Electric Bastion Land or into the Odd. So and just there, I'm kind of keeping them slightly in the background just for the uh, for the incredibly dedicated people like you, Tony. Yeah, and you just become <laughs> a loser with no with who needs who needs work when you get there. Um, I love that. Like, no, I, I I mean, like that's such an interesting because even like the conceit of it it makes the concept of the byline like uh, before into the odd, right? Like because ostensibly this book is coming out afterwards, right? Um, yeah. And you're also not necessarily you are not explicitly situating them in time in that way. Um, it's, it's just, I, I think it's really, really beautiful to explore kind of what does that look like and and how those two things will progress and interact with each other. And I also just think like, it's also really beautiful to give people that in, in a gift of play of like, here are the different things I've made and you should go figure out what they look like and how they fit together at your table is a really beautiful gift to give people like in design space and not being like, and, and having the concepts of here are some of the ways I see those things connecting, but like, like, you know, go, go find out exactly what it's like for you is, is I think is huge, but yeah, I, I love, I love everything about that. So uh, I appreciate it. Thanks for, thanks for sharing. Um, campaign goes live on Tuesday. Uh, what are some things that we can expect from the campaign? What are some of your hopes for it? Uh, give people a little bit of a sense of what's going to happen on Tuesday as it goes live. Uh, you can expect the most simple streamlined campaign ever because I am not doing any stretch goals and I'm not doing any early bird specials and I'm not doing any day one specials and there's no super high pledge levels because what I wanted to do is just have the version of the game, which is if you buy Mythic Bastion Land, you can buy PDF or you can buy print and PDF and there's going to be one definitive version of the book because I didn't want to like have... I didn't want to artificially create stretch goals for things that I wanted to do anyway. So I'm going to try and make the best version of the book um, as it is. And I didn't want to have like limited edition versions and stuff. I, I've tried to keep it really streamlined and just make the the one book the best book. So, um, so yeah, it's going to be a very straightforward campaign. It's going to be 30 days. And yeah, there, there's one book. You can add on Electric Bastion Land um, if you want to pick up the, 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 the double. Um, not into the odd unfortunately just for various boring logistical reasons um but uh yeah it's going to be 30 days and yeah it goes live on tuesday uh 2 p.m gmt um awesome. so yeah hopefully it'll be good love it i'm looking forward to it i can't wait uh for it to get live um if you want to follow the page if you're not yet or if you're watching this later head to ttrpg.link slash bastion land ks uh to go check out the kickstarter project uh, that's right below uh chris's face on the screen or linked in the description probably because keegan's head up the description yes yep. it is um excellent um uh, in the meantime also too again we've got the with sailing going live on tuesday as well and feel free to head over to rpgzine.club um on Tuesday, we roll over from the first month of things, which was Super Dylan's double feature and The Corrupted by Navarre Jackson, um, to our uh, two horror games that we have coming out for this month, which are uh, Fear the Taste of Blood by Kayla Dice over at Ratwave Games. And then we have nice. Layers of Unreality uh, by Josh Hetty, which is Liminal Horror or other RPG system or adventure. Um, Keegan got to write it the other day, but fear the taste of blood sometime in the next couple of weeks that we're going to be get a chance to play. Uh, so please go check those things out. Help support those creators. Help support what we're doing here at Plus One. Um, and we have never figured out a good way to end streams. And at this point, we're not interested in figuring 